We are live. Hello. Great. Hello. <laughs> you are here at Zero Books Basement discussing capital. And today, as per usual, uh, we have Elliot Rosenstock, uh, globally acclaimed author of Zizek and the Clinic, uh, and as he's otherwise known, The Imaginary. Uh, we have the one, the only, Ernesto Vargas, uh, oh. who's surely going to regale us with some stories of the ardor of industrial life in the factories in Mexico, and he is known as The Real. Uh, and we have myself, uh, Conrad Hamilton, uh, who in the absence of the kind of concrete proletarian experience uh, possessed by Ernesto Vargas, uh, will be sure uh, uh, to speak in depth of the sort of theoretical interrelations that can help elucidate our understanding of Marx. Uh, thank you. I see we already have 15 people tuned in. It's crazy, right? We're we're blowing up here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a hop in a, a hop in a step. This is going to be like Joe Rogan. What do you need? What do you? Need? <laughs> I hope so. Then we can upgrade. And then we can have. Then we can we can have uh, uh, Jordan Peterson on here uh, to laugh at his ideas rather than Justin Murphy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jordan. So, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure he would offer a very fair competition in his current state. I think. Uh, I don't uh, think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but. Time, I wonder time, how, for, time for your third steak, steak of the day, Dad. <laughs> that <laughs> that <made. laughs> yeah, it was a good one. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, so <laughs> we're here. We're here to do uh, chapters twenty-eight uh, and twenty-nine of a little book you're likely familiar with uh, on some level if you're tuning in us with us today. Uh, Marx's Capital. Have you heard uh, of this? Have, have you heard of this? Capital by Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> You can tell we have very high energy today, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, look, I, I'm in I'm in Rome. I gotta tell you, it's just fucking hot. You probably can't see it. I just got sweat like dripping oh. off, me, which is incredible. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, this is this is inland Italy, right, and not in the mm -hmm. north. Um, but uh, chapter twenty eight of Volume One of Capital: uh, Bloody Legislation Against the Expropriated Since the End of the Fifteenth Century. The forcing down of wages by act of parliament and you know honestly the title of that almost makes offering a summary redundant because i feel like you, know, you might have cleaned the basic details from the title oh but it's so vicious that's 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 the i think um it's if you read the chapter and if you haven't read the chapter and you're you you're tuning in in order for us to talk about the chapter and get it you should read this chapter because it is like tarantino couldn't imagine the shit they did <laughs> Honestly, uh, it's just so it's so brutal uh, in terms of reactionaries, uh, mm -hmm. like the real of reactionary uh, politics in terms of the monarchy and the treatment of um, the sort of begging class. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as, this, I, yeah. as I was telling to Conrad, imagine getting R inscribed on your shoulder because you're a rogue. This is mm -hmm. this is things that <laughs> this is things that reactionaries did and. 14th, 15th century, uh, be a part of this system. So. Um, yeah, so this these chapters of the book uh, come within the larger subsection of the book on primitive accumulation. Um, and we mentioned before uh, that as capital starts out, uh, Marx uh, starts sort of from the standpoint of bourgeois political economy. Um, that is uh, the supposition of individual commodity producers exchanging goods at their value. Um, but as capital progresses, uh, you know, or at the end of it, as it were, uh, what Marx shows is that that's not the true historical context uh, in which capital develops. Uh, so situated, I think, quite strategically in terms of the presentation at the end of the book, uh, there's this count of the violent conditions that really uh, give rise uh, to bourgeois property owning society. Uh, so in this chapter, what's, what Marx is describing is particularly the sort of uh, legislative uh, and often consequently violent uh, interventions uh, that facilitated uh, uh, the creation of capitalist society. That's chapter 28. Uh, on, on chapter 28, Elliot, did you have anything to add to that about sort of the details of it? Or? Well, um, the late kind of liberalization, you could say, of of, uh, of these sort of be beggar laws, uh, which were basically execution um, and enslave, you know, enslavement. So you were forced to work. The, I the idea is that if you do not work, and then you start begging, um, you, you will be sold into slavery for two years, essentially, mm -hmm. or, and you will be whipped as much as they feel like it. Um, so, you know, they're, you're subject to getting uh, mercilessly beaten for two years um, by whoever will take you in. Be like, oh, I want, 
you know, some, so someone at your trial, you could say, could come up and be like, yeah, I want that person. And then they, they, they'll just beat you for two years. And that was the world. Um, and, that, and then eventually they, they stopped that system and moved to a system of simple uh, imprisonment and execution. Uh, mighty, mighty, uh, mighty nice of them um, to do that <laughs> for begging. And that didn't really get repealed until the early 1800s. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, by Parliament. Well, and this is this is actually really interesting. So the context of this has to do with the capitalist land enclosures that um, begin to kick off, let's say, after 1450 uh, in the late Middle Ages, um, and that sort of presage, uh, uh, you know, the full emergence of the capitalist mode of production itself, which is usually dated uh, to early modernity. Um, but it's very interesting because when we talk about these kind of harsh repressions that are undertaken, um, you know, in order to compel people to work, I think it's important to acknowledge some of the particular social conditions of that environment. Um, so on one hand, you have uh, an environment where people aren't necessarily conditioned to work, right? Uh, yeah. You know, like, I mean, Marx talks about um, how the drive for absolute surplus value, what he calls the unlimited extension of the working day, presages uh, the focus on relative surplus value through automation. Um, but this, this, this injunction to work as much as possible, right, to be as efficient yeah. as possible, in the course of a day, a lot of people, had, you know, were very, very resistant to that, right? Coming out of the uh, the framework of the early Middle Ages, right? Of of kind of independent peasant proprietors who, um, you know, uh, uh, paid a sort of corvée, right, to their to their lords. Um, so then, so you had to have. I'm not going to say had to have, but but uh, you know what was what was used uh, to combat uh, that resistance to absolute uh, subordination to absolute surplus value production were these kind of very very harsh measures. Right, like imprisonment, like potentially execution, um, social stigmatization, uh, and so forth. But actually, it's really interesting, right? Like how uh, how that works, right? Because like you know, once capitalism reaches a certain level of uh, when it's thoroughly installed, right? You see that in a way, it's able to, in in certain respects, become more gentle in terms of it enforces its norms because they are so absolute, right? So I think a good example of that is debt, right? So it's like if you look at historically, it's like you know, before you had the formation of this seamlessly interlinked, um, you know, kind of fluid capitalist economy, it's like, if, you know, there are ways of getting out of debt, you owed. you could just like go to another area, right? And people could never right. track that down, right? So in, in that context, these very, very severe, uh, like putting people in prison for debt, right, becomes like a way of dealing with it. But when, like now when you have these vast digital systems, right, yeah. where debts can be tracked at least anywhere in a nation, and in some cases even broader because there's certain international treaties, um, it becomes less necessary to do that, right? Because because that that become like the debt itself becomes such an impediment, um, you know, to the purchase of of basic things, for example, in a range of contexts that you don't need to lock people up anymore. Yeah. Right? Um, so I think that's that's very interesting. Of course, there's another there's another question there about sort of um, uh, you know the uh, you know at a certain point I think in terms of kind of the Keynesian shift and how our economy functions we begin to realize also like oh well. You know, if you really want people to pay back debts, even you know, maybe it's better to have something like bankruptcy. You're, you're glitching, glitching a bit, glitching a bit again. And do good. Am I glitching? Just a bit. A little bit. Just a bit. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, 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 think, I think I talked for a bit. Ernesto, Elliot, any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, I liked that Marx uh, hinted at, but didn't really talk about too much um, the threat that the proletariat eventually turned to pose at the beginning of the, what is it, uh, what, uh, 1820s, 1830s, right? Um, he hints at it a little bit, like Elliot was saying, but I think, I don't know if you guys have, have anything, uh, any information about that uh, early labor struggle. Do you guys know anything uh, about that time? Are you talking about the trade unions becoming right? Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The formation of the trade unions and so on, because that's the back the backdrop, right, of this uh, of all this text in this case. Yeah. Well, cer certainly, it's it's interesting the the wage the wage battles were very different in terms of the maximum wage and no minimum wage, right. which I found very strange. I still can't really wrap my head around that or the reasoning for it. Maybe Conrad knows. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the maximum wage laws, which existed uh, to protect something, and then there was there was no minimum wage. Um, wait. Um, I also like yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't I don't know the details about that. 
Um, did, does it? Does Marx actually say why the maximum wage? Does he offer an explanation of that in the text? Does it, yeah, we could check. Let's. Okay. Let's, 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 let's search let's, maximum wage. Well, let's, yeah. I also liked uh, how during the text Marx kind of highlights how the state can work very ambiguously, you know, in favor and against capital, in favor and against the laborers. He he's not very um, specific in what kind of way he would like it to work, but. Yeah, uh, I cool. like the focus and exploration. So, okay, this is Marx on maximum wage right. laws. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a, I, I can read, I can read a, I'll read a paragraph in the, in the, and give some context with it. In the 16th century, the condition of labor of the laborers had, as we know, become much worse. The money wage rose, but not in proportion to the deprecation of money and the corresponding rise in the price of commodities. Wages, therefore, in reality, fell. Nevertheless, the laws for keeping them down remained in force, together with the ear clipping and branding of those who no one was willing to take into service. So, oh yeah, branding was part, branding the ears, cutting off the ear. Uh, mm -hmm. so, okay. By the stat, yeah, not to get too fixate on that, but that's, pretty, that's a pretty big incentive to work. By the statute of Apprentices 5, Elizabeth C3, the justices of the peace were empowered to fix certain wages and to modify them according to the time of year and the price of commodities. James the first extended these regulations of labor also to weavers, spinners, and all possible categories of workers. George the second extended the laws against coalitions of laborers to manufacturers. In the, ma in the manufacturing period par excellence, the capitalist mode of production had become sufficiently strong to render legal regulations of wages as impractical, impracticable as it was unnecessary, but the ruling class were unwilling in case of necessity to be without the weapons of the old arsenal, just to say the laws which rule wages. So um, wa wage laws were firmly without question for, um, mm -hmm. for the bourgeois class, still, or the ruling class. Still eight, George II forbade, forbade a higher day's wage than then uh, two shillings for seven and a half days for journeyman tailors and around London, except in cases of general mourning, still uh, George III uh, gave the regulation of the wages of silk weavers to the justices of peace. Still in 1706, it was required two judgments of the higher courts to decide whether the mandates of justices, the peace as to wages held good also for non-agricultural labor. Still in 1799, an act of parliament ordered that the wages of the Scotch miners should continue to be regulated by a statute of Elizabeth and two Scotch acts, 1661 and 1671. So you can see how nationalism kind of creeps in there also to keep wages down in places mm -hmm. which are seen as alien. How completely in the meantime circumstances had changed is proof by an occurrence unheard of before in English lower house in that place where for more than 400 years laws had been made for the maximum beyond which wages absolutely must not rise, Whipred in 1796 proposed a legal minimum for wage for agricultural labor. Pitt opposed this but con confessed that the, con that the, quote, condition of the poor was cruel, end quote. Uh, finally, in 1813, the laws for the regulation of wages were repealed. So um, in 1813, the regulation, the wage laws, um, which benefited, you know, the capitalist class. So you might think of wage laws being repealed as a bad thing, but mm -hmm. um, laws were designed to keep wages low uh, initially uh, so mm -hmm. that people could get labor for cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I mean, it seems to me that like, it seems to me that probably if you look at that shift that at first, I feel like regulating the, uh, the maximum wage probably um, is an effort because you have to remember that socially necessary labor time, like the uniformization or the uniformity of socially necessary labor time is achieved through the integration of capitalist markets, right? right. So I feel like probably this is a kind of effort to like jackboot, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of like something like um, uh, socially necessary labor time into existence. Of course, in of itself, that instrument won't be sufficient, um, but it can help. Um, later, I think once that probably begins to congeal, then there's probably more of a focus on, um, for example, um, marshalling the capitalist class collectively to ensure that, uh, you know, the wages that are given are wages of subsistence or actually permit like the reproduction of labor, right? Because like, you got to remember, like, first of all, like minimum wage laws, like, you know, Italy doesn't have a minimum wage law. I think the United Kingdom established one like in 1997, 
Um, mm. You know, again, I don't know the whole history of that, um, but it's not as if everywhere has these, right? But it's like, even where they do exist, um, you know, they tend to be uh, so low that all they really provide for is like, you know, like subsistence or uh, like below subsistence, um, you know, levels of remuneration, right? And that, you know, as Marx points out repeatedly throughout Capital, um, in most instances, that's something capital has to provide, you know, in order to even reproduce itself, right? So there's nothing particular, you know, in terms of how those are normally wielded, um, there's nothing particularly emancipatory about it anyway. That's, that's true. But I mean, if we go from the, pr the previous chapters in terms of how little can somebody live off of and to what extent in terms of how close to death can uh, a capitalist sort of keep a wage laborer, uh, it, it was in the past, um, you know, in Marx's time, they were kept really on the brink of survival. Mm -hmm. Their wages yeah. were really survival wages. And when those wages went away, they died. They died of starvation. They died of frost, frostbite in the winter, um, things like that. So it's not like they minimum performs no function whatsoever. Um, but similarly, uh, a minimum wage today provides a certain survival survival wage uh it's although yeah. you know various various technologies exist to attempt to make people not starve to death in the u.s certainly yeah but do remember as well like this at this time for example like you didn't have like a publicly developed system of welfare like mostly churches would have dealt with this um so you know it was far less robust uh in that respect like welfare but keep this in mind about minimum wage like minimum wage only applies if you have a job right so, you know, I mean, capitalism has to provide subsistence wages, let's say, to, um, you know, laborers who are needed, right, in sectors of the economy yeah. in which labor is required. But that doesn't prevent, you know, the total evacuation of capital from certain regions, you know, and essentially, like, forcing people to either sort of starve or immigrate, which happened repeatedly. Yeah. So minimum wages aren't stopping that. What I would stress is that if jobs exist, right, that, you know, in most instances, it's going to be necessary to pay subsistence anyway. So you have to ask yourself, really, um, you know, and I think this is the reason why, like, welfare tends to be much more controversial than, mm -hmm. than minimum wage, right? Um, and I will say, I will say, you know, I will say that welfare, like, you know, generally I support welfare, of course, all that. But there can be certain issues that emerge with it. Um, so, like, if you take Canada, for example, um, we, in some of the poorer provinces in Canada, we provide... Um, like there'll be people in, in Newfoundland, for example, which is the poorest province in Canada and the last entry confederation that, f that fish seasonally. Right. Um, and in Canada, what we'll do is like, we'll provide them in many cases with like welfare payments when they're not seasonally employed. Um, and this is the way they survive, but it's like from an ecological and an economic standpoint, it would make a lot, it would be a lot better in a, in a way for those people to migrate to like Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver or whatever. Right. Um, you know, and, and also because of, you know, the cost of, of educating, building roads and so forth in these rural areas, ecological and economic. Um, so there are, I mean, yeah, like generally I'm very supportive of welfare, but also we have to acknowledge that um, from any standpoint, there can be problems with the idea that you're just going to give people money, right, uh, outside the performance of, of labor that's significant uh, to the reproduction of capital. Let's say. What's the problem with that? Uh, Andrew Yang seems pretty stoked on that. <laughs> why not why not why, why not give them a thousand dollars a month well i support it like i support it for, <laughs> I, su I, su I support it i support it fundamentally but like just just to like you know because i think there are a lot of good side effects of ubi right in terms of stimulating demand for goods in terms of encouraging automation in terms of lowering social costs and all of that but to give you an example of where that can be problematic right you know what about again areas where um you know primary resource industries like have like jobs in primary resource industries have been exhausted, right? You know, like fishing, for example, or, or coal or whatever. Um, you know, and what about situations where it'd be desirable for those people to move to urban centers where yeah. their sub subsequent generations would have more opportunity, where the ecological and economic cost is lower for them to do that? You know, is there the risk that something like UBI, um, you know, might um, perpetuate people inhabiting those kind of environments? So I do support UBI, but I just want to kind of say that, you know, as with any sort of ambitious program, um, there is another side of the coin, so to speak. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Capital evacuating. Certainly, we see that in the U.S. Uh, with the minor towns, all the, all the you know coal and places that were very much union strongholds, and the sort of birth of uh, the 20th century 
uh, labor movements have, have uh, seen capital evacuate. Uh, and then people have immigrated, starved, or just sort of barely clinging on to that plot of land. Sort of also, also makes a little more clear the appeal of a city um, to a certain extent in terms of it seems kind of bolstered against this tendency to simply uh, for the region to just collapse. Mm -hmm. Ender says agricultural workers should get two times UBI. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's-, well, that's I think, I, I think, I think um, podcasters and YouTubers should get three times UBI. That would be nice. <laughs> no, I'm <just> kidding. <laughs> Did you hear that? Did you hear that 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 Rush V, one of the guys in the Manosphere, uh, he he claims that he wants to run for uh, uh, to become um, Republican nominee after Trump. And you know, at this rate, he'll probably win, of course. Um, but, yeah, I um, think he would. Yeah, but uh, he he declared that his program was to uh, uh, give two thousand dollars a month to UBI uh, to men, but none to women, uh, thereby. <laughs> Uh, restoring our proper sort of patriarchal dispensation um, uh, and to, uh, I believe, um, impose taxes on the use of birth control pills, uh, the publication of selfies uh, and so forth, uh, and, and to establish what he called a foreign girlfriend program, whereas all immigration of men will be restricted, uh, but there'll be a girlfriend program whereby uh, sort of incel American men can be uh, supplied with beautiful girlfriends from Poland and so forth at the uh, behest of the government. Wow, he's really he, now. That's an ambitious program. Do you think there's another side to that? Do you think there's another side to the coin? Like maybe <laughs> both sides are pretty not good, honestly. On the front <laughs> side, it's pretty bad, and then if you look look on the other side of the coin, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the bright side, I guess it would, it would be very. You know, assuming the immigra general immigration quotas remain the same, it would be very empowering to all those foreign women who would have you know twice the chance. Uh, to come to Amer America, conditional to dating some sort of odious incel. Uh, but then America would have to be a good place to go, and with all these laws that <laughs> Rouge Rouge yeah. v has now mandated for all of America in his stunning electoral victory, where he swept the presidency <laughs> based on his policy I'm of two thousand dollar UBI for men and zero for women to restore the patriarchy. Yeah, and yeah. can you imagine <laughs> all of the TLC? Maybe maybe, maybe maybe America would be a less less good place to go to the tlc specials you're saying this yeah can you imagine <laughs> TLC specials for poland girlfriend you know for the ubi insults yeah and then the we secretary can react to it and we can stream it the secretary of state of course the president will be rushvi and the secretary of state will be justin murphy uh in this new uh so. yeah 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 justin murphy and his ai justin yeah, yeah. Murphy for and the ai Foreign yeah. girlfriend program mo mo synthesis with uh, neo uh, feudal techno communism, and then we'll be we'll be Why good to go. What a, what a patch program. that will be. <laughs> what? That's Why a, not AI would... girlfriend program? Mm. See now that's now that's there now you're into the um, now you're into the hero sphere. <laughs> Man, you, universe you you be universal universal basic AI girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I want to say, I want to say with this, getting back to the the series. So chapter twenty eight. Before I go into chapter uh, twenty nine, chapter twenty eight deals with um, the uh, sort of the conditions um, that were, uh, uh, you know, the violent uh, imposition of the conditions that allowed uh, uh, for the reproduction of of capital. Um, chapter twenty nine deals with capitalist farming, right? So the way that um, the appropriation of um, uh, collectively held feudal lands. Uh, allowed certain farmers um, to become effectively capitalist farmers uh, and to employ uh, large amounts of, of labor. Actually, I think that's really interesting. Now, Ernesto, we were talking earlier, because because today we're doing chapter 28 and chapter 29. Ernesto, we were talking earlier about how you were saying that in Mexico, like land reform has been a really hot button issue uh, right. historically. Um, and how like the, um, I was talking about how in America, uh, in the last time we did this, I was talking about how in America, um, the wide, you know, the particular political and economic structure they adopted combined with sort of the wide availability of lands um, outside the slave owning regions um, allowed people to not work on farms, but to go claim land themselves. Right. right. But I understand that uh, in, in Mexico, um, there, uh, that this may not have been so much the case historically, right? In other words, that there may have been a more uh, feudalistic kind of structure that had existed before. 
kind of. I mean, we had, yeah, yeah, we didn't have a, like slave plantations. So I think that was a, I mean, we did, of course, have, have slave plantations, but we didn't run like an entire economy on it as much as the United States. You know what? I'm not gonna make a definitive statement on that point, but I'm sure, yeah, Mexico had its, uh, its, yeah, its truancy with slavery. But anyway, yeah, so during the American restoration, uh, mm -hmm. the, the American government didn't give the land to the, to the slaves, right? They just uh, let the plantation owners keep it. The slaves, you said, they were free to head out to west. Become, to become capitalist farmers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. To you know, get their parcel of land and their mule for acres mm -hmm. and a mule, right? And mm -hmm. uh, but in in Mexico, we didn't uh, work like that uh, because uh, here we made the ejidos, which are mm -hmm. um, like com not communes, but you know, communally owned land. They have their, pro their programs. They are very bureaucratic. They're very corrupt, but mm -hmm. they are common ownership of uh, of farmland, agri mm -hmm. of agricultural land, of both um, you know grain and forest. Mm -hmm. So the slave owning regions of the United States. I mean, that had a lower population. Obviously, very important if we talk about agriculture. But I was talking a little bit more about the other areas of the United States, and I was saying that there was a problem of actually acquiring private labor uh, for farms. Uh, there wasn't a problem in slave owning regions because you just used slaves, but because anyone could go and just claim what was really indigenous land, right? But what I was wondering is whether the impetus in Mexico to um, to uh, engage uh, to to have this sort of collective uh, lands, um, if this derived from the fact that there were um, more feudal as opposed to bourgeois structures that existed early on in Mexican history um, when people first settled, or, or how, how would you describe that? Here's the thing. Um... In the United States, the United States was constitutionally founded uh, yeah. during the American Revolution, right? And yeah. then you ha have a civil war, which again uh, reforms the United States into a bigger yeah. mass, but mm -hmm. there's no like big change in government, right? And yeah. the revolution was what, 1778, something like that? Yeah. Right? And 1776, Mexico, yeah. Sorry? 1776, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, in Mexico, we had our independence where like you guys did your revolution, we just call it our independence, where we uh, got rid of the of the, of the colonial government and we established mm -hmm. our own empire, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we tried doing it a republic. Good for you guys, you know? Yeah, yeah I know, right? Woo. No, starting, it, starting. It, it did not last, thankfully, uh, mm -hmm. but eventually we were happy, constituted. Happy little empire. Yeah, <laughs> we were constituted <laughs> as a bourgeois yeah. government, uh, sort of. But um, there was a lot of infighting, and eventually we had a a, tyr a, a tyrant. His uh, his name was Porfirio Diaz. Okay. He ran the government for about 50, 70 years, pretty much. You know, like okay. a king, like an emperor. Mm -hmm. He styled himself like visually, aesthetically, as an emperor, even. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, we had a revolution after that, which it was around 1910, 1920, and our okay. reforms came like 20 years after those. You know, you know what I mean? So okay, okay. so we had a popular revolution early in the 20th century. And from that, we did our, our land reform. That really no. reminds me of Mark Zuckerberg's hoodies in terms of uh, his, you know, how he always wears a hoodie. You know, if you're, yeah. if you style yourself like an emperor, you're yeah. much more susceptible to being overthrown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, I'm just like you guys. Porfirio should have worn a, worn a hoodie, yeah. How do you, yeah, yeah though I'm not sure. I'm well, not sure. He would have got overthrown. He would have been like, that guy's, what is that? Yeah. I'm, not sure how, I'm not sure how truly, I'm not sure how truly successful Mark Zuckerberg has been in humanizing himself. Um, I would say like at best, he looks like a tadpole most of the time, like in his photos. <laughs> he, he, well, he wears this really, as that, that sort of paparazzi photo revealed, he wears this really heavy zinc, uh, <laughs> sunscreen so he, yeah when he goes out so he like looks and he looks like this like greased up pig going into going into the water <laughs> to cool it off so it doesn't die in the barn or something. i do like his hair <laughs> well what i want to what i want what i want to say here is it's interesting right so i'm reading a book on on the history of italy right we're talking about agricultural land and it's very interesting because um in a lot of places right you had this uh expansion of certain private farms Right, that that um, Marx is describing here with with uh, capitalist farmers, right? So you have this in Italy as well, um, and this obviously um, dragged down considerably. Uh, you know, and of course it evacuated certain regions uh, of uh, agricultural populations. In other areas, it dragged down the living standard for people to a large degree. 
Um, now, what's interesting is that in Italy, um, in spite of um, certain efforts by the Italian left, that problem was never really resolved, right? But what's interesting is that the way that it sort of gets resolved, like land reform is never really achieved, right? But the way that the problem sort of gets resolved is that um, basically in like the 1950s and 60s, huge numbers of small peasant farmers, um, that is people who, uh, you know, employed farmers or small peasant farmers, that is people who were working um, on uh, farms or just had a, a small and really untenable um, segment of land for themselves. Um, a large number of them moved to urban cities, like from the south to, to northern urban cities like Turin and engage in higher paid industrial labor and so forth. So it's kind of funny because the government boasted of like, oh yeah, we're solving, you know, the problem um, of, you know, these sort of disparity in agricultural economies, but it was more of like a liquidation of the problem um, in the sense that it was only really, it was only really urbanization, right, that yeah. solved that. Now, I think in the United States, it plays out a bit differently historically. And I want to say, it's, it's surely complicated, um, but I want to say that part of the reason for that, um, the book references like the farmer ideology of the United States, but I want to say that part of the reason for that is because in the non, non-Southern, non-antebellum, parts of the United States, that uh, you had a lot of independent farmers from the get-go because of the seeming availability of land. So my only question to you about Mexico, because I'm certainly not an expert in Mexican history, my only context was, like, was Mexico exposed to the same thing where capital, like, what were the inceptive condition, conditions of agricultural settlement in Mexico? Um, you said slavery was not used, so maybe land was widely available. I don't know. Um, but was there that sort of process whereby capitalist farming became much more um, uh, you know, pervaded the society much more. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and then and that it was addressed through land reform. It was led by Porfirio Diaz, actually. Uh, that, that whole um, retransformation of, of uh, rural land into actual uh, capitalist holdings. He invited mm -hmm. a lot of uh, American uh, capitalists to speculate. And they took away land rights. Yeah, yeah. They, they, and that led to, to the armed popular revolution. And okay. that didn't lead strictly to a, to a land reform immediately because mm -hmm. the revolution wasn't a, a full popular revolution. It was, you know, like all revolutions, it had its failings. It turned into a bourgeois uh, government and so on. A couple of dec decades later, we finally had our land reforms with, uh, I think, Lázaro Cárdenas or uh, a bit earlier. Yeah, speaking of the bourgeois revolution, um, some, Marx really makes clear how... Um, it really was a bourgeois revolution in France in terms of uh, laws against trade unions were reestablished when, during the French Revolution. Oh, we have to talk about trade unions because we're getting on that and we want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And just, just to be clear, um, Conrad, we I'm not sure if I if I uh, answered your question, but yeah, yeah. we had uh, after after we were independent from the from the Spanish and mm -hmm. we struggled with empires mm -hmm. and so on and so on. We had a kind of a feudal system. And then, mm -hmm. then that was, uh, as we turned into a bourgeois government uh, under Porfirio Diaz, that was where he opened the gates for capitalists to exploit. Okay. And so then, is... uh, as Ender is pointing out in the chat, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, the revolution exploded and one of the slogans was land is for those who work it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is just interesting though, because what I was trying to get at is that it seems to me that the United States never really had a feudal land ownership system. Yeah, right, no, no, no. I think what was very interesting is that they went from slavery to chain gangs, right? To the penitentiaries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay, you're talking about the South again. You keep going to the South, right? Yeah, I'm and sorry. That's, I'm that's sorry. actually different. We have to define two yeah. separate trajectories. Like, yeah, um, yeah good you know, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and also because like the way that slavery even functioned in the South, because it was exposed so much to the conditions of capitalism owing to the late date at which it continued on a mass scale, were different than even historical forms of slavery. But what I want to say is that in the non-slave owning United States, um, right, again, the right. ability to claim free land meant that there was never really a feudal structuration of land ownership. Um, yes. Now in the South, it wasn't, of course, it wasn't feudal either because it wasn't based on um, serfdom. It was based on like direct legal subordination of slavery and well, very, very and you know, subordination. Yeah, you know, what's really interesting about it. People talk about the three fifths compromise is like, oh, that's so dehumanizing. Slaves are three fifths of a person. But you never really hear how it totally compromises, like totally compromises democracy. One vote, one person, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly, mm -hmm. you, if you own a hundred slaves, you suddenly have sixty votes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so it's 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 not just it's not just the dehumanizing of slaves, which it is, but it's also the total undermining of uh, democracy in favor of bourgeois landowners as well. 
Well, the 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 like the undermining of the even the notion of the American Revolution was very very strongly um, always a part of Confederate culture, right? So, like, I think if you read like um, some of the political manuscripts uh, that are central to the foundation of uh, the Confederacy, they talk about like rescinding uh, the ideas that were entertained at the time of the old Constitution, right? So, you know, this was kind of their permanent solution, right? Um, you know, was to they knew that they would have to rescind some of those ideas because of the the ambiguities in those ideas that could be exploited uh, to make the case against slavery, mm -hmm. right? You know, the rights of all men to be born equal and this kind of thing, right? Now, of course, in practice, that hadn't prevented, you know, slavery um, from being very entrenched in the United States, but they knew it could be parlayed, right? Even at that point, um, and even as Lincoln, people like Lincoln were active in doing, they knew it could be parlayed into a case against slavery, right? Mm -hmm. But I just, Sorry. I think that's, I think that's interesting because it seems to me probably that the, the that the, that the, the, the existence of serfdom in Mexico, if I understand you properly, um, probably um, paved the way for a very, very uh, brutal transition into um, capitalist farming um, yes. along the lines of what, what Marx yeah. is describing here. And yeah, it was that, I mean, it led to an armed revolution. That's not always the case. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that because like the thing is like, you know, when you when you have serfdom, those people don't technically have any claim on the land. So this is actually right. different than in the non slave owning United States, because those people would have had a lot of the farmers would have had um, a legal claim on the land. Right. right. Um, Unlike now where we all claim land. Just yeah, no, here they were campesinos. Just we all ran. And, and peones. You know, <laughs> uh, which Marx, uh, Marx does point out that Juarez abolished uh, peonaje. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know like 15, 20 chapters ago. Mm, okay, we have a good memory there. I think 15, 20 chapters ago was like, uh, you know, Doug's son, right? All working on that stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, um, so I guess what I mean is that, like, this is what Marx is describing here, is the way that um, this legal structure of serfdom is such that those lands can just be, um, people can be just as possessed, right? So, yeah. you know, if that's, what, if that's what happened in Mexico en route um, to the establishment of capitalist farming, it makes sense that the violence of that um, would have been severe enough. Here's your accelerationist Mexican, okay, uh, to provoke uh, right, this right. backlash Mexico itself. In, the, in the form of this revolution for land redistribution and collective farming, which you're describing. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because, like, when you're talking about collective farming, I mean, that's a more egalitarian mechanism than really anything we find widespread in the United States. That I'm right. Um, yeah. but well, that, it was that hailed as socialist. It was like literally hailed as, hailed as socialist when it happened. Yeah, was that, and was that, was that Zapata, right? Is that what we're talking about? No, no, um, no. I'm talking about the, the agrarian socialism of the reforms way later, okay. way later. Way, way later. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican history. Is very Sa Zapata weird. was uh, a left-wing uh, revolutionary, of course. Yeah. Okay, okay. He's the Those one are... uh, who, who quoted earlier, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, so that, so that, and would you say, so would you say that that kind of um, is the basis that those those legal changes are the basis kind of out of which the Mexican left, those left energies kind of emanate in Mexico, would you say? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you, you know M. N. Roy, right? Uh, no, you mentioned him. Familiar. You mentioned him in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of your um, essays. Who did I mention? M. N. Roy, yeah, the founder of the Socialist uh, Indian Party. Uh, oh, probably, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you so know, he they came asked, to Mexico. They asked, they asked, I just want to say, they asked Liz at one point, they said like, didn't you, didn't you say such and such an essay? And he said, like, look, I only know what I'm doing right now. Like, I literally don't know. <laughs> no, I, I get else. that. Yeah, okay. I get that. So, like, yeah. Continue. <laughs> right. Okay. So M. N. Roy, you, you mentioned him in one of your essays. Yes. He, mm -hmm. he was an Indian uh, uh, socialist, Marxist, mm -hmm. and he came mm -hmm. to Mexico and he founded mm -hmm. our alternative party, mm -hmm. but uh, our like revolutionary party. So mm -hmm. we were uh, Marxists, but that was uh, snuffed in the, in the crib. Okay. By um okay. by counter revolutionaries. Okay. So this party, you're talking about a left wing party in Mexico. How long did that exist for? It's still alive, technically. One of our okay. major parties is the is that party. It just okay. changed names, changed uh, bureau, uh you know bureaucrats, and it's a completely different thing now. Well, yeah. What is it now? Like a social democratic party? Um, I'm not sure if M. N. Roy's party is now the PRI or PRD. Let me check. Pri, 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 pri is that that party? PRI is like obviously not a Marxist party. PRI. Is, yeah, none of them are. Right? Uh, it's like yeah. a it's a hard reactionary party. Yeah, mm -hmm. they most of them all <laughs> are all are reactionary now. Um, I'm just gonna check Mexico, Mexico. 
right? He fled to Mexico I saw, I saw in late 1917. I want, to, I want to get the hat. It says Supreme. He it founded has, yeah, the Communist uh, Party of Mexico. <laughs> uh, he founded the Socialist Party in yeah. December 1917, and then it was converted into the Communist uh, Mexican Party, which is the Communist Mexican Party still alive right now. Okay. It's called the Communist Mexican Party. But yeah. the the Partido Socialista Social Obrero, which was uh, founded by M. N. Roy, also became the the, uh, pa the PRD, Partido de la Revolución Democrática. Okay. Yeah. So this yeah, is this is interesting. This is interesting to me because, like, if I just want to just to diverge a little bit, this is interesting to me because, and I'm really glad we're talking about this in depth because I think it's important. Our audience is probably bored. We're not talking about Nick Land or something. Um, but I'm kind of um, I throw, I throw in the jokes. Don't worry. I'm like uh, I'm like uh, what's the I don't know, one of those baseball announcers that. Yeah, like I'm not, the, not old, the old drunk ones that don't really want to pay attention to the game, but then they hear, you know, the the guy who's really going. He has some bullshit to say. Except yeah, more, yeah, that's good. You, that's I, a, that's I a good. Not to get canceled by saying a city is a bunch of a bunch of f words, like the Cincinnati Reds guy. That's a it, that's a good yeah. that's a good role to play. I I wonder. So obviously, in the United States, like historically, you had, um, you know, uh. You know, there was there was a need for less agricultures. Obviously, you did have urbanization because of that. Um, but it occurs to me that, like in Italy, for example, you had like just an absolutely enormous transfer of population from rural areas in a relatively short period of time after World War II. And it seems to me that in American history, um, probably part of the dependence on immigration owes to the fact that um, you, uh, again, you had this more this this more equalized and notwithstanding the South, you had this more equalized agrarian dispensation from the get-go, right? And again, what is referred to in the book I was talking about is farmer's ideology. Um, and I wonder if that meant that, you know, conditions were, uh, in certain parts of the United States, um, were good enough for agriculture to sort of scrape by for a long time, right? So you didn't have like, you know, this, this like in Italy, it's absolutely enormous. I mean, like, um, you know, I think 700,000 people uh, move from the southern south of Italy to Rome in the span of a decade, right? Um, so that's an enormous transfer of population. Um, it, again, it seems to me that in the United States that that the 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 rural to urban transformation was slower, and the yeah. immigration played a big role in furnishing um, cities with the labor force, the need for factories, and so on. Well, certainly the lack of the feudal history changes the dynamics of the United States in compared comparison with uh, Europe to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So Ender says the PRD was the left-wing party that launched AMLO for Mexican city mayor, but he left and made his own party. Yeah, Morena, which is the party that, he, that he's president. He's president now because of Morena. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, could we say, could we, do, could we, do you mind if we, so we've been talking about this a little bit. Do you mind if we, I just want to, because a lot of people have been asking us lately, a lot of people have been saying, what do you guys think of, of uh, Belarus? Uh, and I right. wondered if you guys have been following it, if you have any uh, on that. It seems yeah. like, yeah, it's in, in the context of anti-imperialism or whatever, sure, USA doesn't really have an opinion, but it's clearly a a very, the, the government is tra trad reactionary slash, you know, Stalinist in nature, and they're mm -hmm. pulling, w pulling women who are walking in the wrong place and, um, and beating them and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a hard... Uh, dictatorship where there's no sort of legal accountability uh, mm -hmm. or guide for policing. I don't think I don't think China is anywhere in terms of if you're comparing it to a modern communist state. Mm -hmm. I don't think um, China would ever come anywhere close to the brutality that you're seeing in Belarus. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, China's China's a fairly um, cosmopolitan totalitarian dictatorship um but, <laughs> but um, they're very you know very progressive minded um but um you know it's like the the dictator of morocco you know who builds these solar panels and stuff yeah yeah the king right? yeah the king of morocco yes yes um i heard he's gay by the way i oh. i've spoken to some morocco the king, and they say that king the king of morocco is gay i heard you know? well, he's First of all, a king should always be gay because it's kind of a it's kind of a you know a position that it needs some dandyism. You could say, it yeah. I think dandyism really spruces up a kinghood. Yeah. You well, don't want it, you don't want some king that's like, oh yeah, I'm going to the football game. You want, <laughs> you want, like, you want like the dandy. You want a dandy king. I'm, yeah, I'm pro. Yeah. I'm pro. 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 I'm a reactionary with the uh, they have to be dandies in, in order to inspire the vote guys. Queer that's, monarchists. That's my Hegel. That's yeah. my Hegel thing. Ergo, Belarus doesn't fit this model because they ha they're a very hard straight reaction. 
uh, okay. quote unquote, the party of Lenin and Stalin. <laughs> per the, what, I'm, what I'm wondering though about Belarus is, you know, because one thing you see, like <laughs> I noticed that as soon as this conflict sort of broke out, um, that the European Union stepped in and they were like cautioning Russia against being overly involved um, in the um, in the actions of the government. Um, yeah. I understand that the um, the current leader, uh, what's his name? The leader of Belarus, the current leader. Lushenko? Um, is that it? Look, look I understand it. that. Has he proposed, he's proposed look a referendum. It. He's proposed a referendum, has he not? Yeah, Lukashenko, um, yeah. He's proposed a referendum, no one. What, for what? <laughs> what did he propose? Because oh. it seems like he doctors everything in order to maintain power and people don't like it. So what Yeah, I don't know. I um, thought posit that would be a pseudo reform so he, or something. Uh, Tom, are, you, are you glitching? So he, yeah. I mean, his, his position's funny. He's like, I'm going to hand over power, but not under the pressure of demonstrators, right? Which is a great, um, you know, kind of great play. Um, so it seems like, but I guess what I'm wondering about, because I know, like, I'm, I'm more familiar with, with the Ukrainian situation. I'm wondering about certain parallels. I mean, um, one thing I saw when this... Well, yeah, well, from, from what Ender shared, um, oh, yeah, that's what Ender wrote. But from what Ender, <laughs> Ender shared to the... To the to the uh, group, uh, one of the big differences is there was sort of a large Russian popular support, more so in the Ukrainian situation uh, than there is in uh, in uh, Belarus, where there's like almost zero Russian popular. They, they don't really want to be part of Russia at all. It's like less than 10%. Uh, oh, is it really? So have they, carried, have they carried out polls on that? I mean, not about being yeah. part of Russia. Russia. Being part of Russia is a bit of a well, like question. Seeing, yeah, know. seeing of them. Uh, or also, yeah, the poll is also how do they see themselves as Belarusians? Are they Belarusian nationalists? Are they former Soviets? Do they describe mm. that that's like 10% of the population? Um, so one of the issues is Belarus within the Soviet, I'm, I'm just, thanks Ender. Oh yeah, thanks Ender <laughs> for the sources on what I'm about to say, uh, which I'm just gonna sort of repeat verbatim for the most part, which is during the uh, S Soviet Union, Belarus had its own sort of national identity and had their, its own language and it was very difficult uh, to sort of parse the nationalists from the Soviets and there were lots of purges of the nationalists, but then there was also this attempt to integrate Belarus into uh, into Russian, you know, Soviet uh, dominance, you could say. Um, so they, they were actually successful to some extent, but there is a very, very large nationalist contingency within Belarus that's always been there. Um, that's been very Belarusian, uh, you know, uh, culture and tradition and that's that seems to be what has taken power although they say they you know luca cites some um, cites you know where the you know they make mockery of the power of uh, the party of lenin and stalin uh which you know which you might hear that and say that's pretty based honestly <laughs> what a based thing for a world leader to say uh, going against the neoliberal capitalist order so there really is not a great dog in the fight um certainly you really need the third pill a little bit because uh, you know, the protesters, they certainly don't like what's happening. I guess you can, I guess you can align with them to a certain degree, but uh, I, I think, you know, mo what most of them would like is to be a Western European country to a certain extent, or at least have Luca give up power. Um, uh, but it certainly isn't a left wing movement. And they, cause, you know, the protesters say, well, we are ideology free. They like are very proud to be ideology free, which you see in the yellow vest protests as well. Which is not right. a good. Which is not a good. Um, it's not a good thing, <laughs> you know. That's like people are like, oh yeah, we just we're just fighting, and this was this is post political. I mean, what it really means is you're not very organized, and you might not get a lot done um, because you are quote unquote post political and unwilling. Which is sort of the geist of the times, you know. This idea of oh, the left wing, you know, r equals rad lips, and then right wing equals sort of Nazis and then to abject yourself from both Radlib hysteria and neo-Nazi discourse and then be post-political, the post-political subject. But you really, sh that's not really a good er uh, area to inhabit because it sort of relinquishes your political agency entirely. Um, I guess what, I guess what, first of all, I want to, I want to just say about Belarus, I see two things, like on one side, um, the European Union has reached out to criticize Russian tampering in the situation. On the other side, Russia, Russia. has re re Russia has reached out to criticize European Union tampering in the situation, um, yeah. and I understand that NATO has even went so far as to deploy tanks in the Belarusian border. Um, they, they deny it, but 
Yeah. Okay, they but, deny it. Well, okay. well, it's silly because, I mean, the truth of it is it's the mm-hmm. Lukashenko nationalist regime, like tampering. What tampering? I mean, besides the nationalist regime being like, we won with 80% of the vote, right? So. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's a Fox News report, so I'm not sure how, how I can, how much I can trust that they deny it. They, that, oh, you, yeah, well, it's possible to, you know, deny all Western media is one idea, but it wouldn't surprise me if um, the vote was manufactured based on their sort of brutal policing and uh, disregard for law in other areas. Um, um, now I'm seeing, I'm looking at some polling data, wait, um, voting on a hypothetical referendum, the unification of, do Belarusians want to join Russia? So I have some p- polls here, just keep going, I'm just going to read these, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's, there's a question of what, let's get it, because, you know, obviously the protesters are simply saying don't brutalize us to a certain extent, right? I mean, that's got to be part of the message. Um, mm-hmm. And then then you get into this idea of, you know, if you really read Marxist texts or, uh, or, or especially Lenin, I mean, um, the idea of activism being like a good thing or like a simply sort of... Um, useless useless kind of pseudo pseudo i guess movements uh you're not i don't think you're gonna get modern modern the people in within the modern spirit to sort of um move over to this sort of idea so you get you get the sort of very basic demand which is like we don't want you see this in hong kong as well like very basic demand which is which seems like to a non a non-political subject or non uh you could say read up subject in terms of like, well, we don't like that we're under this hyper surveillance. It's, we, it's like, do you like it? No, I don't like it. Do you like it? No, I don't like it. Okay, let's protest. And then they sort of go up against this gigantic mechanism, which is, you could say in China is counter, uh, you know, American imperialist to a certain degree, although they have their own little uh, local imperialism, which sort of uh, in terms of asserting dom or asserting land o- asserting land over ownership over other smaller territories, but that's that's not quite the same thing as American global imperialism certainly. Um, so so to go back to Belarus, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you get you get a bunch of like trade workers and uh, they they want basic they want the government to basically not be a threat to them and the government is clearly a threat to them, right? They're their physical survival threat to them. Um, so they organize against it, but it, but uh, the reality of the situation is that the Lukashenko regime is not fucking around, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're just like, they just do not, they just do mm-hmm. not give a shit. I don't think they need outside interference to bust the heads of protesters quite thoroughly. Um, and from, you know, from some of the, you know, the also also the protesters use Nazi collaborator flag. That's what sources are for, mate. You're welcome. Okay. Also, the protesters use Nazi Nazi collaborator flags. So yeah, and the people who run the opposition groups are in Poland and Latvia, who are very anti-communist. Sure. Um, and that's the issue here, where you get these sort of human rights ideals, um, which is basically anti anti-governmental. Uh, authority to sort of enact violence uh, to a certain extent, and then um, they end up being taken up by, you know, the bourgeois revolution to a certain extent, right? Uh, the the result of that, you know, to 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 say that the Luka, Lukashenko regime or the Lukashenko government, the Belarusian government, would be better or worse under neoliberal capitalism at this point, you know, with Luka gone and then. What what would that mean for the workers? I have no fucking clue whatsoever. Um, <laughs> I really don't, honestly. Uh, I you can I, I mean certainly um, tools would be taken away that could that could lead to uh, growth in a certain manner, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That's what I, I don't know if anyone else knows uh, the specifics of the Belarusian economy better than me. Or what would it what would it mean to be integrated into the sort of EU order, mm-hmm. uh, right? One Bella. thing, one thing, one thing that's very interesting. I have I have some polls here now. Um, I, I you know I don't have full citations on them, um, and <clears throat> they are from 1999, so they're from 20 years ago. Um, yeah. but one thing that th- this points out is that um, because of the war in the Balkans, and I assume this has been put up by like pro Russian parties, 
But because I guess at the time of the war in the Balkans, they did some polling in Belarus and there was a strong support of unification with Russia. Um, that probably, keep in mind, that was just a few years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah. And also people were probably spooked by the events of what happened in the Balkan Wars. But look, like, I guess what I want to stress here is that, um, you know, what I have found, um, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of my experience in Ukraine and now Belarus may be different. But one thing I've, I've found uh, traveling um, in some of these areas of Eastern Europe, it's a little bit different when you get into Central Europe, places that are closer historically to Germany and so forth. Um, but is that um, <clears throat> it seems to me like if you take a country like Ukraine, for example, um, that that um, at least in the Russian speaking parts of it and keep in mind, Belarusian and Russian are very close linguistically. Right. Um, and there's been a big there's been an ongoing assimilation of Belarusians to the Russian language um, <clears throat> that's continued to pace. Um, even as Belarus has been a separate country, which is fascinating. Levels of Russian speaking are spe like they speak more Russian now than they did, you know, in the past, in spite of having been independent. Um, so again, that that demarcates a slightly different trajectory um, than than Ukraine, and indeed a, a more ru Russified trajectory. Um, but what I want to get at is that um, in the Russian speaking parts of Ukraine, and again, most of Belarus, I understand to be Russian speaking. Um, the predominant consensus I see is that people don't want to um, necessarily be part of Russia. Crimea or something is very strongly connected, but I'm talking about Kharkiv and so forth. Um, they want to be an independent country. They want to have democratic accountabilities and so forth. But they also want to preserve strong ties to Russia because that's sort of their linguistic and cultural identity in a lot of respects. Right. Um, so you think of like, I, you know, I come from um, southern Ontario. Well, also like to not, yeah. not, not just linguistically, to be a Marxist a little bit, also economically like Russia. You know, Russian funding uh, to Belarus is oh yeah, yeah. Is culturally, culture, culturally, but culturally, economically, everything. But I don't think it's just economic in the sense that um, you know I think there are economic opportunities that are portended by you know the entry in the in the European Union, for example. But part of it here has to do with like your fundamental identity uh, as an individual. I mean, I'm thinking about where I'm from, right? You know, in yeah. southern Ontario, which is very very close culturally to the United States, and even if you know, let's imagine some crazy hypothetical situation. Okay, even if, um, you know, tomorrow um, we had the opportunity to say substitute like American investment for Chinese investment, um, you know, in, in American cultural exports for Chinese cultural exports at no economic loss to ourselves, again, purely hypothetical, um, you know, this would be like, a, this would cause be a huge source of cultural unrest, right? Because we're so invested um, in that kind of American identity. Um, so I'm saying that a place like like Belarus has been so historically adjoined to Russia that I think it gets into a bit of a difficult problem because I think especially with older people, um, I think often what you have in these countries is you have on one hand a desire to preserve the continuity of that relation, which is the continuity of their sort of life world and, and civilization in a lot of respects, um, but also to, uh, you know, achieve a rupture with the forms of oppression um, that are characteristic of the Lushenko government, for example. Um, but, you, and then you see in a way like you, you know, but often I think the way these situation do, do situations develop is they kind of polarize, right? Especially with the way Russian relations are with the West. So you either, you know, side with a kind of autocratic form of governance that's backed by Putin, right? Um, or you're, or you're in the case of, of Crimea, right? Actually annexed by Russia, um, which most people in Crimea wanted, but okay. Nevertheless, it still violates international law. Um, uh, or, uh, on the other hand, you enter into the kind of European uh, uh, sphere, um, but that itself poises great risk. I mean, again, it's very destabilizing, I think, in terms of the history and culture sure. of a lot of these nations, economics. Just uh, I think also, it's, it's also very <laughs> destabilizing in, in terms of security, right? I mean, they're talking now about uh, Ukraine becoming a member of NATO, I believe. I mean, you can imagine like the kind of, because that, that would put, put the Ukraine right at the frontier yeah, really. um, you know, of that kind of conflict. Um, so again, I think this would be my suspicion about, again, um, you were, you said that in Belarus that there's very little support for Russia. I, I suspect it's quite nuanced, the situation in terms of um, support. I suspect so. I, I mean, in terms of support for the continuity of that relation, but not Russian yeah. dominance. Um, that would be my suspicion. And keeping in mind that Belarus is more Russified than, than Ukraine, like people speak Ukraine in, right. in the West of Ukraine. Um, but... Uh, Again, I, I think there, there, there's probably a, a great deal of skepticism about um, about Russian subordination. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Or... Well, it reminds me, in terms of this relation between the sort of uh, cultural 
export nation and then this sort of smaller nation. Kind of reminds me of the U.S. and Canada, although Canada is large enough to have itself. I would say more, more sort of solid sense of self perpetuation, and also they have economic um, sources of uh, income. So I wouldn't uh, overstate the case. I mean, half of you know, you know, like <laughs> you want to like, overstate. You know, like, the no, I mean, you know, 70% of our trade is like with the United States. Yeah, so it's okay. like, this makes us totally, you know, and of course, like every single, yeah. you know, um, sort of odious coup that's been launched recently by the United States, um, you know, yeah. Venezuela and, and Bolivia and all of these places, um, uh, you know, and all the actions against against Russia unconditionally and not saying Russia is good, yeah. unconditionally and so forth have been supported by Canada at a foreign policy level. Um, yeah. So, so it you forces know, Canada into this sort of U.S. imperialist game you could say yeah, well mostly we? mostly we mostly we just kind of virtue signal we mostly do the same shit <laughs> Most, and then like and then once every virtue signal imperialism but but not <laughs> yeah well like once in a while what, like once in a while we like to we like to do like essentially what the united states does but then like just um just be a little better than your like you know shit pile of political <laughs> governance and then yeah you know, it's not hard to do that. because we are pretty bad well, that's the thing, and so we only ever compare ourselves. We only ever compare ourselves to the United States because the United yeah, States yeah. is the only is the United States is the only country Canadians know anything about, other than Canada. Actually, you know, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, uh, he said, um, I, "I love this too." He said, um, uh, "Americans are different than Canadians in the sense, or they, or they, they say that Americans only know about one country. That would suggest that they know about one more country than most Canadians." Um, <laughs> Which, which I, I think is a great quote and probably true because the thing yeah. is like in, in the United States, it's like, you guys are totally myopic. Okay. American media, whatever, whatever. You don't give a shit about anything uh -huh. else. You're in that block blocks. The, the richness of American culture and economy blocks out all the daylight from everywhere else. Um, you know, Pharmacon, as Stiegler would call it, good and bad at the same time. Um, but uh, like in Canada, um, we are, uh, we live, you know, like mostly lined up along the US border um, and, uh, we actually don't really see or know our own country. We just consume American media, um, that also just infers messages to us about the United States. We don't really know the United States that well either. So actually we don't really know anything about anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, uh, again, um, but I just mean to say that we like to once in a while. So like we have, we have public Medicare, you know, so that's, that's our, our claim to fame, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, that's our, uh, uh, that's sort of dog and pony trick. Um, but, uh, we, we also, we like to, we like to mostly support your wars, but to opt out of like one, just for good measure, like every <laughs> few decades. So for example, we didn't go to Vietnam and we also didn't go to Iraq. Um, but we did go, but we did go to Korea and Afghanistan just to stay in your good books. So, <laughs> and the U S doesn't really antagonize Canada for not going to Iraq is what are they going to do? Really? Like, you don't, well, like, well, that's pretty lame. Okay. I'll see you. See you when the Leafs play the Kings or whatever. <laughs> I thought it was funny, of course, when, by the way, I just want to add, I thought it was funny when, um, when Ernesto, uh, uh, when Ernesto, when Ern Elliot, when you were talking about congratulating her in Mexico on having this great vast empire, um, because I find happy, this there to be, empire in I find there to be some irony in the <laughs> fact that, I find there to be some irony in the fact that um, Elliot is living in a previously annexed uh, area of that empire. Yeah. Uh, well, keep in uh, mind it was annexed from Mexico, but it was like one guy, one or two guys who owned all the land, and then the United States came. So, like this whole this whole teleology that the, oh, California used to be Mexico. It's like hold up, California used to be indigenous lands, yeah. certainly, but in the capacity that it was Mexico, it was like one big. <laughs> like, it was like, I, he's like i own all this <laughs> <laughs> that's that's essentially how it was mexico and then you know as soon as the settler came and the you know the bourgeois landowners were like mexico save me it's like fuck you <laughs> and again you know the guy who owned all of california essentially end up dying a, a poor man strangely enough that was actually why that. we that was actually why we settled the prairies in canada because like um canada had had claimed it um via the rupert's land settlement um but there was nobody living there. So we were worried that Americans were just going to kind of join. Um, so, we, but of course the problem is the problem. No, it's true. But the problem is like, nobody wants to live in fucking Winnipeg or whatever. I mean, can you fucking imagine? Oh my God. Um, so I, by the way, let me guess it's cold. Oh yeah. It's cold as hell. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, Alberta and, and Saskatchewan, you don't even want to, no one wants to live there. Um, so um, Alberta, the only way I think people from Alberta are very nice. I've only had good experiences with people from Alberta. Personally. Yeah, that's that that's 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 <laughs> actually that's like the that's like the Texas of Canada. And actually, this is really funny because um, 
like Canada adopted same-sex marriage legislation really early. Yeah. Um, and at some point, every province in Canada uh, like legislated same-sex marriage into existence, um, except, except Alberta. Albert. Except yeah. Alberta, so the federal government had to actually pass like a federal law just to get Alberta, because uh, you know Alberta cowboys, petrol. Um, yeah, you know, it's very gender uh, gender stratified, especially because of the oil industry as well. Oh yeah, no, no, it's yeah. it's tremendously gender stratified. Like I I met a girl, um, Kayla, Kayla. I'm trying to remember her last name. Anyway, she had one of those sort of round Ukrainian faces. I met her at a, a French language exchange I did years ago. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, actually. <laughs> But she was from Alberta, um, and we met, uh, and uh, she was like, she was like, like I was just talking about books and stuff, and she was like, wow, she's like, I've never met like a guy who talks about like books and stuff. That's really like, yeah, um, right. because you know they all go to like work in the like rig pigs, you know, work in the in the oil, and the only people who I like women in those communities, like, um, you know, by the way, Nickelback is from Alberta, just so you know, okay, women from those communities, like. Um, I love these guys, right? Like, uh, that I, so much about this that. is how oh. you remind me of what <laughs> I really am. That's great. <laughs> that explains a lot, actually. Okay. Mm. That's, that, was like the <laughs> national, that was like the national anthem of Canada for like two years. Okay. But, um, so, um, you know, so, uh, in those communities, uh, the women, um, normally they either just marry to the guys, right? Because they have good jobs and they become stay at home. Yeah, sure. Or like a small sort of like, um, you know, liberal elite, uh, sort of Hillary wannabes or whatever. Um, they, no, I'm just kidding. I love them. Um, they, uh, go, uh, to like, to, to usually abroad for school. And then a lot of them don't come back because they end up in like the service industry in or professional jobs in, in Toronto or Vancouver or whatever. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it is. Um, but anyway, in Canada, nobody wanted to live in the prairies. Just nobody wanted to do it. Um, so, uh, we, the only way to actually get people was to like go to like the poorest motherfuckers in Europe, like basically like really like Ukrainians who were living in like feudal system, you know, in like um, 1880. And we were like, if you come and clear this land, we will just straight up give you this land, not even charge. Um, yeah. So that was how we got people to live in the prairies. And, and I'm proud to say, because it's not easy to do this, that today the coldest bona fide cities, I mean, you know, cities with a few hundred thousand people or whatever, yeah. today are in the Canadian prairies and Siberia. And in both cases, of course, there was um, strong, if not forcible, um, <laughs> you know, forms of relocation um, <laughs> that, that encourage that. So um, that's that's kind of that. But I don't know. I was talking about how Canada has no sovereignty, right? Um, what were we talking about exactly? Yeah, well, oh, yeah. Let's continue. Sorry. Well, we, we could also go back. We were talking about Belarus, and then we were talking about U.S. Canada's. Uh, but to go back to about, like, to what extent, um, I guess I guess the cruelty of, of, of the feudal society is is I think part of part of what bourgeois revolutionaries, to a certain extent, try to work against, at least in contemporary society. Certainly, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the branding, and the you you know in Belarus, you see the beatings. Um, like the very severe beatings for, you know, kind of tenuous reasons. Uh, I would argue, okay. I would argue then, though that, okay, sorry, continue. And then, so there, there is an antagonism here, which is there's, I, you know, and nobody's really, I haven't really got a good answer on this, which is this tendency of, of uh, bourgeois societies to create domestic policy, which is suit people. They're like really careful to, sort of try to uplift certain areas and then they, you know, they keep worker wages down like in the U S or they, you know, continue um, to sort of gentrify and, and um, in certain ways, but a lot of times you'll, the tendency to ignore, ignore that for a second is to have this domestic policy and then to have this very sort of brutal imperialistic idea with alien nations because they do have sort of a foreign, a power department. So that's why I'm very, I'm very careful about what do I think of Belarus? Well, I think would I want to live in Belarus? Uh, fuck no. <laughs> I would not want the police to be able to randomly just take me off the street. And I mean, you're me. also, you're all, you're also Jewish. So <laughs> also Jewish anti-Semitism, you know, and that's not something to be taken lightly. Um, By the way, I know nothing about anti-Semitism in Belarus. I'm just going off my worst sort of reflexive assumption. Um, um, <laughs> so so yeah, a, but, I did watch Borat. But but the problem, the problem with speculating, or, or in terms of what should Americans do about um, 
the sort of brutality of dictatorships, I think is, I think is a question. And I think the real answer, which isn't given a lot of light is like nothing. It's like these dictators are brutal, but American imperialist efforts are bad. So you shouldn't do anything. Essentially. Uh, you, you know, the people, people then come to mind with the, the Holocaust and things like that. But, you know, I would say Americans should, should bow out for the most part. Of, of of trying to intervene. And I think that goes goes with the EU as well. So the EU sending tanks to the border of Belarus to try to continue sort of neoliberal imperialism in a certain extent. Uh, I don't I don't think there should be any question that socialists should be against this. Um, this sort of movement, this sort of annexing of um, foreign territories into the neoliberal global order. Yeah. You know what phrase always comes to mind, which is the right wing phrase, which is, you know, I, I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> uh, I, I always I always think glo globo homo, which is like the, the very, the oh, pro yeah, yeah, yeah. state, which is they just link all the LGBT plus with neoliberalism. Yeah, in globalism. That, that's how domestically they they um, they frame their their anti imperialism of other nations and they sort of bring in these reactionary tendencies but isn't that isn't that isn't that, <laughs> that is that that different than than like now obviously like you know this is sort of all kinds of homophobic connotations and so forth but it's not the basic idea uh that's being articulated also by homogenous, the phrase homogenous homogenous culture neoliberal culture which is homogenous right yeah well um, but isn't the, isn't the basic idea of that though not so different than than when zizek talks about for example about kind of like um you know or even um um because we are here on a zero books uh podcast um Nagel, uh, we'll talk about like kind of the the appropriation of like the culture of permissiveness by neoliberalism, right? Um, so mm -hmm. I think there's a significant question of how off base that is. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Like last night, um, I had the experience of watching a movie, um, and I'm going to cycle back and talk a bit more about Canada and Belarus and all this in a minute. But I had the experience of watching a movie um, <clears throat> uh, by a Japanese director from 2001 called Ichi the Killer, um, and it basically is like a very, very stylized film that's kind of a succession of hardcore torture um, scenes and rape and so forth. Um, and at a certain point, like <clears throat> I stopped, you know, I didn't want to keep watching the movie. And it's not like because like it was hard for me to watch in that way. <clears throat> I guess it's because like, I think, you know, we can talk about a movie like Salo by Piero, Piero Pasolini, mm -hmm. um, you know, which also has these very transgressive kind of representations. But the thing is like, I think in like, you know, again, I'm looking, I'm st studying a little bit now the history of, of modern Italy. Like, if you look in Italy after World War II, um, there was a kind of unstable coalition of pro-Catholic moralist elements and like pro-liberal American elements on the right. Um, but the point is moralism was still very, very important to the culture of the right, right? Um, but I feel like over, you know, and this is very clear in Italy, but over the years, moralism has declined in its importance and kind of Catholic yeah. permissiveness or kind of capitalist permissiveness is inclined. So I think part of what, what frustrates me about a film like that is I feel like in the 70s or something or the 60s, that might have been emancipatory in a way, um, yeah. you know. But I feel like today, um, no, I'm not saying in every, I think, still think there are forms of social transgression that are very valid. Um, but I feel just like, you know, kind of representations of rape or torture of this kind of thing. It doesn't really seem to me to challenge the system or achieve any kind of, I guess what Jameson would call cognitive mapping, um, you know, in a meaningful way. And, mm -hmm. I, I, and I wonder about this kind of like pure impulsive uh, 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 kind of transgression, um, you know, and how how useful that, that actually is today in challenging the structure of capitalism. Well, I, yeah, I don't think so. I think I think it more keeping keeping in mind your position as a sort of western socialist and to not be essentially echoing cia talking points which i like to do once in a while so. although I'm, I'm i'm in recovery i'm in recovery from echoing cia talking points especially regarding hong kong because i mean the truth of it is if i was in hong kong would i be like pro chinese communist party if i was born in hong kong uh, it's hard to imagine i would be but in terms of uh, you know, as as an American socialist looking, it's like what what should America's role be in regards to Hong Kong? It's like, well, essentially, American imperialism is bad, so fuck off. <laughs> that's that's essentially America America's what America's role should be uh, regarding Hong Kong. I think also with Belarus as well. Yeah, I guess I guess what here's here's the thing about Belarus. Okay, so I see you want to get on that. You really want to talk about the imperialism stuff, so we'll do that. Um, here's the thing about. 
But Lewis, it, it's just what I said. Like, you know, I, I see it as, um, no, I'm not, I'm absolutely would not. I've, you know, I've probably been guilty at times of glorifying China in certain ways. And some people. Really? Are, You've been guilty <laughs> of glorifying China? Wait, aren't we so, going through the entire works of Dane? <laughs> um you know i've made less less often less often remarked perhaps is the fact that i do make a lot of criticisms of china um and that's apparent even my debate with burgess about the subject um but what i want to say is um you know i think I, I absolutely would not um glorify the the russian state uh, i think there's a lot of very negative things i mean for fuck's sake like they finance the far right in europe um, very, very directly. They've loaned large quantities of money to Marine Le Pen, for example, in France to advance her agenda. Um, you know, but uh, as regards Belarus, what I would say is that I think um, a lot of these states in Eastern Europe, you can't underestimate the degree to which uh, the expansion that the, the expansion of the European Union is also a kind of neo imperialist prerogative. Right. Um, yeah. And so like what, what hap what's happening now is that Belarus, which was previously an ind independent country, very much within the Russian um, milieu of nations. Sure. Um, you know, that the European Union is also, um, I think, looking for an opportunity to potentially um, turn it in certain ways. Um, well, sure. And also Poland, you know, historically, thanks, Ender, uh, <laughs> was also historically trying to annex Belarus to a certain extent as well. So, okay. so this is, it's an extension, an extension of the Western border of uh, Belarus with Poland. I, yeah, don't, we, don't tell yeah, Polish people that though, because they're always victims. I'm Polish, you know, right? Vic, I'm the great victims I'm, of you know. Okay. Yeah. I, well, I'm Polish Jewish. Uh, they just killed all of us. I mean, we. No, no. I meant I meant like Christian. I meant like Christian Polish nationalists, like oh, you know, yeah, right, the great yeah. victims of history. No, you know, we couldn't. We couldn't possibly have done anything bad to the Jews because we're such horrible victims ourselves, and so on. You know? Yeah. Oh, really? Is that is that what they say? It's the, you, It's so it's so awful. There the. <laughs> the you know, in Poland, in Poland, you in Poland, you can't. It's illegal to say the word. It's like illegal to say the word uh, Polish concentration camp. No, it's not. No, it's illegal. Look it up. It's illegal. It's actually illegal in Poland to say the word Polish concentration camp um, because German concentration camp, which, of course, it's like, you know, well, there were like Polish people who worked there and like all kinds of Polish people who turned in their neighbors, you know, also hoping yeah. to profit from um, land that would be appropriated. Um, I mean, there's always there's always two sides, right, to the the to the. Uh, to the actions of uh, Poland in World War II, I always see the two sides because mm. and I've spent a lot of time in Poland learning about it um, because on one side, um, you know, you could say, look, Poland was the only country where they had the punishment for helping Jews was family death. They would kill your family. Um, and also uh, more Polish people than any other country uh, were honored with medals from the state of Israel for helping Jews after World War II. Okay. On the other hand, um, you know, if you look at uh, a film like uh, Shoah, right, by Claude Landsman, for example, I don't know if you've seen this, it's considered probably the definitive film in the Holocaust, like a nine hour documentary, French Jewish, friend of Deleuze. Um, if you look at a film like Shoah, um, what Landsman argues is that it was because of the extent of anti Semitism in sort of Polish feudal culture that the Germans elected to build camps there because it was actually much easier. Uh, to acquire the complicity of the local population. And I think you can see a lot of examples of that too. Um, so I think there's always um, two sides of that coin sure. in terms of, you know, but I think one thing that we've seen in Poland, like, you know, and it, it makes it easier that, you know, the Jews mostly left either in the 60s or uh, after uh, uh, the fall of um, the Eastern Bloc. Um, but uh, one thing you've seen in Poland is a consistently revisionist attempt to present um, you know, Christian Polish populations as, as pure sort of victims um, and to say that there was no complicity uh, in these events. Yeah, well, it's totally foolish. I mean, a West, a sort of central power went went East and over overcame the sort of obviously weaker Polish army and then, um, you know, capitalized on the historical tension between Christian Polish and Jewish Polish populations, which has always been sort of the case and sort of this is how many Ashkenazi tailors there are, this is how many Polish tailors there are, and um, you know, pogroms based off of uh, ca uh, capitalistic motives. So then suddenly, you know, Germans march and it's like, we're gonna kill all your competition, and <laughs> and we're you know, they're like, oh, great, and I didn't like that guy anyway. <laughs> Where, where's your you said you have Polish roots? Where's your where in Poland? I forget the fucking it's very 
but okay. uh, the, I know the place had 100% Jewish death rate. <laughs> Uh, but we left during we left during the pogroms, which has a nice paragraph of Alexander the Third. Um, so Alexander the Second was a somewhat liberal reforming monarch, uh, and then Alexander the Third, who was ruling over the area at the time, then reversed a lot of uh, the liberal reforms and also sort of increased the uh, you know the structure that allowed for the pogroms to occur against the Jews. And then when that was happening in the 1890s, that was when my family, uh, both sides of my family actually, they both had the smart idea, you know, of leaving <laughs> at the same okay. time. Yeah, good um, call. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do you know the first time the Polish government actually legally punished people for a pogrom, do you know? Do you know that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I know it, I'm just asking you a rhetorical question. Oh no! What? Oh, you're like quizzing me. Why don't you tell? Yeah, me I'm that? quizzing you. It was, uh, it was, um, it was in the 1950s, and it was like it was under Stalin. Was the first time they ever actually legally punished people uh, for a pogrom. Also, the socialist government in Poland post World War II was the first time Poles were ever allowed to serve in Polish government. Um, so, uh, of course, all of these things again today yeah. when you go to Poland are not really acknowledged. They're like, oh, that's just the terrible Judeo-communist repression, and um, you know, uh, they actually say that. I don't know if you know that the Polish government. Um, uh, law and justice, uh, they actually referred to their opponents as advocating, quote, Judeo Bolshevism. Um, that was their. Still? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's still uh, very yeah, much. This, this, well, this is clearly why, you know, the Holocaust was able to happen in Poland, right? <laughs> if, if it's still in contemporary society there, pointing to Judeo Bolshevism. <laughs> what other countries are doing that? Ukraine's not doing that. They're like a neo Nazi party. Uh, right. You mean they are doing that in Ukraine? Because I think I don't, I don't know. Do they do that in the Ukraine? Yeah, Judea? yeah, yeah. No, no. Of course, yeah. They, they, like they the do all over. Yeah. No, and in Hungary, they sh they sh they shut down the Lukash Library, like in Hungary and everything. Like, no, you see this all over. Yeah. In in Eastern Europe and so forth. Uh, not everywhere. I mean, it, look, it varies from country to country. I'm just saying it's very common in that part of the world. Mm, here's a nice picture of Trotsky. <laughs> I'm just look, looking through. <laughs> Judeo Bolshevism. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, but no, we don't. We don't need in the West. We don't need to talk about Judeo Bolshevism because we have, uh, we have postmodern neo Marxism instead as a kind of cipher or semaphore uh, for the same thing. Um, thank you, Jordan Peterson. Uh, but um, what I wanted to get at was okay. So we were trying, but we were trying to get to this topic. We 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 kind of digress. We're trying to get to the topic of Belarus. I see Belarus as, um, you know, between torn between. Uh, you know, um, you know, Russian imperialism, um, European imperialism, um, European, you know, and, and European imperialism may be uh, in its present form of the European Union, um, <clears throat> less direct, directly repressive in certain ways. Um, but uh, again, I think the solution, you know, to say that we should support uh, the, the protests in, in Belarus, I agree. Um, but I also think that <clears throat> um, that shouldn't, you know, manifest as an unconditional support for uh, European integration. I don't even, I mean, like, you know, I, I honestly don't even know. Um, I would say I would be a, pro I probably would be a protester, but in terms of, you know, the, your role is, uh, you know, a Western socialist uh, regarding internal protests of dictatorships, right? Fake, fake mm -hmm. elections. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it's something to be careful about because, you know, the internal conditions of Belarus are obviously not uh, of the, you could say, the living condition standards, which you can be afforded here to a certain extent in the U.S. I don't, you know, I don't know how that, you know, <laughs> Ernesto's like kind of smirking because there's obviously problems with that because there's large gap. Uh, but yeah, so what is, what is the role of socialists in terms of internal foreign disputes and at what point you go in, like the idea that uh, the Western powers, the neoliberal powers should go in in, in the sort of sense of they're preventing a Holocaust type situation. Um, mm. And I would say pretty much never, like almost never. Like the rule should be, I think for socialists, when do you go in and, and intervene in internal disputes of uh, these dictatorships? Um, you know, never to a certain extent. You could say worker salt, you know, I think we can talk about what are, what are the working conditions and have conditions with the trade unions. And I, I think another thing that Ender Sengi uh, 
we'll bring up Ender. Thank you for that sort of. Uh, um, is the trade unions aren't necessarily aligning with the protesters, but within the media framework, um, everybody's kind of coming out of the woodwork and they're protesting better trade conditions, right? Or better union conditions, or better working conditions. And it's sort of all getting captured into an anti-Lukashenko uh, idea. But the, I, I guess people, there is a general sort of dis discontent in Belarus, right? So to mm -hmm. bring it back, bring it back to this, there is a general discontent that there is this sort of um, dictatorship. Um, they did a general strike. Uh, so, you know, solidarity to the workers, I guess you can say. That's, you know, beyond that, I don't have anything. Uh, mm -hmm. to <laughs> um, I mean, I don't, again, like, I, I just, I think that, um, again, it depends on, on the will of the population, obviously. Um, yeah. You know, I, I suspect that I, what I said, what people want is not to be uh, a flashpoint for confrontation between, you know, the European Union and Russia, um, to be a country that enjoys sovereignty, democracy, accountability, um, the continuity of relations with Russia and openings to the West. Um, so, you know, I think all those things are desirable. Um, I would just hesitate. Uh, my only point was I would just hesitate to work right to a pro-European position, um, whereas that may not be consistent with the desire of the population. Um, now, you mentioned before that you don't think people support um, Russia. What that exactly means, it, it can be very, very loose. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I think, I think a better, like, discussing it, I think a better way to put it is we don't really kind of know the polls. You have one from 20 years ago. I have one from, like you said, a modern Western source um, in yeah, terms of hard, what yeah. is the general support of I think I think it's possible that they don't want me typically don't want to be part of Russia. Well, no, I'm yeah. sure they don't want to be part of, part, like, I'm sure they don't want to be part of Russia today, um, yeah. after, long after the Balkan Wars, long after the end of the Soviet Union, um, in terms yeah. of the majority. Uh, what I suspect is that um, it may well be the case that the majority of people, it depends on the birth rate of the country too, it may well be the case that the majority of the pop population favors the continuance of cooperative relations with Russia, which is a different question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that may not be possible, right? If 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 you got an opposition government in that went like headlong, that took a headlong, a dive to try to make Belarus like a Russian or sorry a European territory, um, you know that could really put a freeze on those relations in a way that could be very damaging in certain respects for that kind of continuity. Um, so again, I just think I I just think it's it's important to pursue democracy uh, within a context that doesn't succumb to the 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 traps that are sort of being laid. Uh, by the imperializers in the situation, be they Russian, be they European. Sure. I wonder what the class character of these of the protesters are. To mm -hmm. go back to to go back to sort of Hong Kong <laughs> a little bit, and to go back to the chapter chapter yeah. 20, chapter twenty nine, Genesis of the Capitalist uh, Farmer. To what to what extent is Marx still relevant when analyzing uh, Belarusian? protests would be the would be the sort of question I would lob up, right? Is the sort of question I think that bears uh, answering in terms of talking about expropriation to who who owns, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the creation of the oligarchs and the sort of looting of, um, of various institutions of power within Russia and um, Belarus as well by capitalists. Um, I think Marx is very relevant to understanding what is happening in Belarus because who are, you know who are the people that benefit from the Lukashenko government? I don't know entirely, but I I, I have you know I, I imagine it's not um, your average wage labor uh, to a certain extent, and yeah. I imagine I imagine the people who got lands expropriated from the Soviet Union uh, benefited quite a bit from the Lukashenko government. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's yeah, yeah, that's the case. That's that's the case with most of these things. Um, I although I just wanted to say that I do have a, a great analysis um, of the the class composition of the protests. Apparently, Lukashenko himself uh, gave a a brief analysis, and he referred to the protesters as quote rats, trash, and bandits. Uh, so if that's what you're looking for, uh, there you go, Elliot. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, but in terms of is is that really the case, right? Is is he referring to class, uh, or is that was, he just, that was a joke? That was a joke, by the way. Just to be clear. <laughs> well, no. Well, I think it bears to say that he did refer yeah. to the protesters as rats and trash and bandits versus mm -hmm. Marx in terms of the people uh, in England 
you know, they mm -hmm. actually were taken from the land and they had to, they, you know, they had no place to farm in the it's sort of agrarian society uh, that, that would be dissolved and created like a real class of like a real kind of beggar class. Um, and I don't think it's probably not necessarily the same thing. It is more of an idealist conflict and a sort of, a sort of wish for an, an a general anti-authoritarianism, I imagine. Right. I suspect. I suspect about, about the protests. I suspect that um, people. The, the I, I, I suspect that it skews towards people who are um, younger, maybe, and more social and somewhat socially mobile, but not beneficiaries of the current um, uh, economic dispensation, um, which is connected to Russia. Though I do, I know on the page there certainly is some working class support. Uh, I see here. On August 14th, working class people from Minsk Tractor Works also joined the protests in front of the government house in, in Minsk. Mm. Um, they, they took part of a protest with 16,000 people. Um, so, you know, if you Google around, yeah. you, were talking, you were talking about labor unions a bit, right? So that participation. Yeah, and I think it is good when, you know, the question is, should we consider Lukashenko like a hard reactionary government? Because it's simple, like, and then what is, what, what do we think of a hard reactionary government? Is Lukashenko a hard, like, kind of right-wing dictatorship? He, he seems to like Stalin and Lenin a whole bunch. I mean, that doesn't make him left-wing. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I, I don't, like, I find, like, at a certain point, you know, these terms can be a little bit difficult. Um, you know, yeah. since, since, I mean, clearly, like, if we look at, like, you know, what's right, <laughs> you could look at maybe... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, clearly, Guido declares himself. <laughs> my favorite, my favorite, actually, uh, thing about Guido recently was apparently uh, Donald Trump um, said that he had second thoughts about his support for Guido, <laughs> saying that um, he feels that in light of his repeated failed coups, uh, that m maybe Donald Trump said he's a loser, uh, and possibly. <laughs> And possibly he called them the Venezuelan Beto O'Rourke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was harsh. So I thought that was great. Probably deserves it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, he Pro probably not as good as sk at skateboarding, though. Um, though, it is <laughs> though it is interesting that both those guys look like their wardrobe was financed entirely by Abercrombie and Fitch. I don't know what it is about like the the Caucasian new, like colonial set in Venezuela and the Abercrombie and Fitch aesthetic, but. Um, um, yeah, it's it's the it's you know it's uh, I feel that the Latin American uh, bourgeois character is very tied like to the American South character. So they like like this uh, whole you know like kind of plantation owner-ish aesthetic. Mm. Okay, yeah. is, that Aber is that Abercrombie and Fitch? I don't know. Um, I mean nowadays, yeah. That's, I mean that's maybe like that or Banana Republic. Okay, yeah. Mm. Um, with it, it's a bit it's a bit hard though. So I, I saw in a presentation at HM. So to use Putin as kind of an example, like. Okay. Um, I saw a presentation at HM, and it basically pointed out that um, because of the collapse, like to respond to the collapse of international investment uh, in Russia uh, that's occurred as a consequence of the, Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, um, Russia's basically made up with it with different forms of federal spending. Um, so, of course, like, of course, uh, you know, again, I think of it as being, you know, even even. And this is why this is the truth of sort of the thing where conservatives are like, you know, Nazis or socialists. OK. Um, you know, there's a long history of, um, you know, fascists sort of using public spending, especially mil military spending, um, you know, to generate a level of social welfare uh, that uh, creates the support of, uh, you know, a segment of the population. Sure. Um, and so I think that without saying well, he's Hitler or something, um, I think that in some ways, if you look at what's going on in Russia, the extremely conservative social ideology promulgated by Putin um, you know, and sort of the, the homophobia and the support for the European far right and the restoration of the Russian Orthodox Church and all of this. I think that that um, does, you know, put him on the right in that respect. But 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 he's certainly he's not like a uh, it's not it's not a neoliberal position. Exactly. Is it? I mean, well, in some not ways, like a Saudi but it's king not unambiguous. Like he's not quite a Saudi king complicit with the U.S. entirely. There's like there's these different sort of 50 shades of monarchy. Right. <laughs> well, but it's interesting though because because but it, all, though, but it all ends in, it, it all has sadism and eating. It's interesting though because even in the, even if you look at like in in Saudi Arabia, like they do provide a lot of programs, um, like subsidized programs, right, to try to appease the population. Sure. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, of course, like um, uh, this is 
always necessary. I just meant that very often we say right, like we're talking about sort of the, the neoliberal right, you know, um, which even even in certain, you know, partial ways, Trump diverges from. But often, you know, I, I like, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but when I think right, kind of the archetype in my head is like George W. Bush or something, you know, sure. and, 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 and sort of the, the coalition of, of neoliberalism and conservative social values that he represented. Um, of course, you could say even in his case, well, that's very complicated by the huge war expenditures, right? But okay. Um, but again, um, uh, I feel like um, with someone like Putin, um, you know, and, and it's interesting that there's this, this affinity with Trump in some respects uh, in that way. Um, I feel like we are talking about um, something that's a little bit more correspondent with the spirit of 20th century fascism in the sense of there being this great focus on kind of, um, you know, using forms of infrastructural development um, and public investment to appease the population, but at the same time, pursuing a very, very conservative social policy. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what, uh, that's the kind of proposal we're having here in Mexico by the conservative mm -hmm. government, of course not as bloodthirsty as the ones that you have in territories that with actual history of armed conflict day to day. But yeah, we, we well, get, you know, uh, you know what I want? Point. Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, what I wanted to read from the chapter, which is the, the third, the last footnote in this very short chapter nine, um, in terms of, uh, in terms of the tendencies of neoliberalism, or you could say Republic mm -hmm. Republican democracy, quite frankly, um, and the, you know, they talk about in chapter 29, they talk about this class where the Lukashenko's of the world or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. or the monarchs of the world and the, and the, uh, peasants of the world sort of are both losing some value given the monarchs, still the monarch, but they're, and then this class arises, uh, that's able to sort of, um, you know, ex exploit this and, and, the middle it's not quite the middle class currently and in the in the sort of british time it was uh these sort of farmers who became very very rich and they were never farmers themselves and they were able to lower wage labor so okay just to read this footnote briefly already it is evident here how all spheres of social life the lion's share falls to the middleman in the economic domain e.g financers stock exchange speculators merchants Shopkeepers skim the cream. In civil matters, the lawyer fleeces his clients. In politics, the representative is of more importance than the voters, the minister than the sovereign. Um, in religion, God is pushed into the background by the mediator, and the latter again is shoved back by the priest, the inevitable middleman between the good shepherd and his sheep. In France, as in England, the great feudal territories were divided into innumerable small homesteads, but under conditions incomparably far more favorable for the people. During the 14th century arose the farms of poor terriers. The number grew constantly far beyond 100,000. They paid rents varying from one twelfth to one fifth of the product in money or in kind. These farms were fiefs, sub -fiefs according to the value and extent of the domains. Um, and then, so I'll skip a bit. The oppression of the agricultural population under all these petty tyrants will be understood. Montiel says there were once in France six, 160,000 judges, where today uh, 4,000 tribunals, including justices of the peace, suffice. So going back to, going back to some issues with Belarus, you could say, you know, the hundred, what ha what happens in fascism, right? Something to keep in mind. What happens in fascism, which is people who are able to, um, I guess, grab a hold of the state and embody the sort of, you know, reactionary ideology, become these sort of little petty tyrants to mm -hmm. a certain extent. So you don't, you don't necessarily want to live in Belarus. <laughs> like, like, just to make it clear with all the talk of imperialism and, you know, maybe, maybe the United States should not. Um, there should there, I think it's it's a very difficult situation in terms of you might have to I, you know we might have to fall onto Zizek you know unfortunately which is I I just prefer I prefer not to which is which is better I prefer not to really. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, think, they, I think I think I think part of the if I had to define like what separates um, you know fascism from let's say um, neoliberalism coupled with the support for conservative social values. Right. 
Um, yeah. I, I think the way that I would define it, um, I'm thinking of Alfred Son Rethel's um, analysis of uh, in the origin and the um, the class structure of German fascism. He has a book, which is a wonderful book. He worked actually with a, uh, like a lobbying firm for German export export industries. Um, and then he was a leftist, so eventually had to flee. Um, but he wrote like their trade papers. So he was right kind of in the belly of the beast uh, in the Nazi machine. Um, and one thing he points out is that like when the Nazis uh, began to take power, um, they were supported by some ca capitalists. So they're supported by members of the Harzburg Front um, and, and basically industrialists that hoped that um, Nazi spending and munitions would rescue them from the Great Depression. Um, a lot of military support, obviously. Um, but they were opposed by a whole other segment of capitalists. And the capitalists they were opposed by were basically the more like internationalists, like Siemens, the bank, for example. They yeah. like, had a fucking meltdown because they were like, we're going to lose all different kinds of like international contracts and like bidding opportunities if they yeah. just like alienate everybody else. Um, so I think if we look at what fascism represents, as opposed to, again, like this kind of mili militant neoconservative neoliberalism, if you will, I yeah. think we could say that like... Um, you know, and I don't know, maybe it's already like Western chauvinist to try to draw this kind of line. But I just want to say that if we look at someone like um, George W. Bush, for example, not to obviously not to valorize George W. Bush, because I see that's a very common location today. Uh, yeah, um, I think that um, it's like with George W. Bush, you have uh, he, you know, I think there's a sense in which he's still quite connected to like the more international and cosmopolitan elements of of capital. Um, whereas I think what you get within um, fascism, a more fascist dispensation anyway, is you get a really strong focus on sort of nationalism, um, you know, and more parochial forms of identity um, that actually pits itself against more cosmopolitan elements of capital, siding definitively um, with uh, more localist and military elements. That's how I would uh, characterize that difference. I don't know if you guys agree with that or what you think. Uh, that's it. I would say that's that's pretty spot on. Mm -hmm. yeah pretty spot on. And I think uh, that's what I think that's what's yeah. what scares people about Trump, right? And it's interesting like Trump is like totally opposed by like these big international silicon valley capitalists. Um but uh he is like very very loved by these more like lo like you know, I think he has a lot of um military support. Um I think he also has a lot of support from certain forms of domestic industry that are concerned about international competition, um primary resource industries like coal based in the United States. So this the appeal is more localist and nationalist. Um, yeah, then, I think, I think you know. we, yeah, I think something should be kept in mind when we are talking about these countries and, and, you know, I think there's a tendency, a sort of Marxist Leninist tendency, certainly to basically just give blanket support for these sort of dictators mm -hmm. and to not do that. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, uh, generally it's like, oh, I support this dictator and all their sort of reactionary actions this is a very common theme. Yeah, like, critical support yeah. for Juches and so on. Yeah, Juches. Yeah. No, no, I, mean, I, don't, I don't support I, that. I, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but not even Juches who's like, you know, technically, you know, a Marxist Leninist. I mean, just like overtly reactionary governments. Right, but, right. Yeah, they're, they're not Marx. I wouldn't say Juches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marxist Leninist, but it's certainly a, an attempt at a communist government. So even ignoring North Korea for a second. Sure. Um, you know, support of. Assad and Syria on the basis of, uh, no, really. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. No, I see it all the time. Yeah, yeah. anti imperial given like to what extent should the U.S. be involved there? So I think the Marxist-Leninists are correct. The U.S. Sh should get the fuck out. It's a stop. Stop it. Right. But they, but they won't because they're, you know, they're the, they're holding on to as much power in the world as they can. And, you know, the mindset of Americans are essentially, you know, as much control, you know, your team America you want the whole world is your territory you want to create allies and if you're not an ally you're an enemy you know you're an enemy country you know mm -hmm. so that is how they think of it and if you go um if you go and you watch you could watch videos on youtube of you know like high end the higher sort of um us troops and them you know they you know that's how they talk with things it's like we are over an enemy country we are this or that right um so it, Something keep in mind, but but that I would say let's let's at least for the for the sake of ourselves and for the sake of the politics of our countries and our communities, and um, mm -hmm. you know what we have a handle on. Don't just don't just blanketly support reactionaries like Lukashenko. Sure, sure, no, no, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, you know, I stand by all my comments about you know not veering into one camp or the other. You know, in terms of yeah. being a, an, an imperialist duality. Um, 
you know, but uh, again, I want to stress, I mentioned before about, you know, the character of, of, of fascism um, having to do with the affirmation of uh, military, um, more nationalist or localist uh, uh, capitalist interests um, and the corresponding conservative ideology of that. Um, and one thing that's interesting about this is like, um, you know, it's still, uh, it's, st you know, like it still raises a question about China, doesn't it? You know, because on one hand, of course, um, you know, there has been some people kind of in the extreme of, of xenophobic uh, sentiment who've kind of branded China as fascist. Um, on one hand, you can say that, well, China does support, um, you know, uh, its, its domestic enterprises uh, as a means of uh, staving off um, the payment of rents to foreign firms, um, that it regulates the internet along national lines and so forth. Um, but the thing about that is that I think that one thing that's very notable about China is, let's say, the relative absence of a strong conservative social ideology. Uh, it's, it's there a little bit. A little bit, yeah, yeah, but, but uh, definitely, yeah, yeah. But like what if, you mean, look, like, if you look at Chinese propaganda, a lot of it, well, I think before certainly Corona times, which is like, here's this family, this is the family that did this and stuff like that. Um, that I wouldn't say that's necessarily the same, but it's not the same thing as paying heed to religion and, and you know, so they're very much anti, you know, if you're a member of the Communist Party, you can't participate in religion or spiritual rituals or anything like that, mm -hmm. right? Well, it, it's very interesting, right? Like if you like one thing, I guess what I'm saying though is that in Russia, like they've very, very, they've really exploited these social issues. So like if you look at same sex marriage, um, you know, in the last polls, now, you know, Putin has turned this into like a litmus test of whether you're a true believer in Russia or not. You know, there's been a real critique of sort of like homosexual ideology emanating over the West, right? Um, and, yeah. you know, this, this has resulted in real physical harms against people who've tried to have parades and things like this, um, or even just been on the street. Um, now, it's very interesting because in Russia, Russia's like, they have opinion polls here. I love this, global opinion polls on, on same-sex marriage. Um, Russia, you know, the countries that that are the lowest support for same-sex marriage in the world are these kind of Eastern European countries, mostly. I mean, you have a few like St. Vincent or Haiti, you have a few others. But mostly, I mean, you see Armenia, Moldova, Kazakhstan, Russia. Um, we're, in Russia, we're talking 7% support for same-sex marriage, 85% against. This is not just an organic development in public opinion, this shows, you know, again, we're talking about some of the lowest rates of support in the whole world. This shows that there's actually been um, an exploitation of these sort of tensions, right, by governments, um, you know, to, again, turn it into a kind of litmus test, are you real Russian, do you believe in our nation, and so forth. Also, if 10% of people are gay, you know, that, that makes the support of gay marriage lower than the percentage of actual gay people. Assuming yeah, that. I, I mean, I don't know about that. that, that <laughs> I, I love that. Ten percent. That's how it is. Every exactly. species. <laughs> like, I, I, I heard it. I heard it in grad school. It must be true. <laughs> yeah, and in Sparta, everyone was ten percent. hundred percent. No, uh, in Sparta, in Sparta, hundred percent gay. Uh, in Sparta, hundred percent. Or is everybody ten percent gay? gay? <laughs> that, yeah. That's. I like exactly. that. <laughs> I love that though. Ten percent. Ten percent. Okay. I mean, this whole thing, like, I got to say, this whole, like, this whole idea that homosexuality is genetic, I mean, I can't, okay, or heterosexuality, I mean, neither is, you know, I, I do like what Peterson says, though, about, like, modern, like, uh, kind of, like, gender politics, like, liberal gender politics in the States, because Peterson's, like, um, the according to modern gender ideology, Peterson's, like, uh, he's, like, all, um, all gender identities... <laughs> All gender identities have a basis in biology, except heterosexuality, which is a social construct. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is like, yeah, like, it's like, okay, that is kind of how it works. Um, but I mean, no, I mean, I, I just think it's like to kind of, for, for gay rights to kind of, uh, uh, you know, try to advance itself on the same lines as like civil rights. It was, you know, there were a lot of like very biologistic arguments made, like, um, but you know, it's like, I think people should be allowed to do what they want regardless. So I just feel like hopefully we can move beyond that at some point. Like, you know, this whole thing, like, well, think, if this finger yeah. is longer than this finger, you're a homo or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 well, that is, head. you know, the get out the clippers. It's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like that one. I think I think maybe they should they should have been doing tests like that all the time. And just just shorten, don't do all the bullshit with the skull. Just just say, is this finger longer than this finger? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, well, well let's, let's talk about, let's talk about. No, no, but I, wait, let me talk about well, China. This has to relate to China, and you can then talk about China all you want after I pose this question, okay. Okay. which is, to what extent does the state act against 
capital, international capital, use the authority of the state to act against capitalism. Oh, ch China? Yeah, yeah, in general. Okay, so like as yeah. No, but okay, but but what I'm what I want to say about China is they do do that, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say compared with Russia, no, look, they've elevated 200 million people out of poverty since you know in the past 20 years. Russia has, I believe, the most unequal wealth distribution in the world, along with the United States. Got to double check that. Um, but um, you know, I mean, Russia, like you had this this real oligarchization of the country after, um, you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union because people were like issued certificates of ownership in public companies. Um, and um, and uh, then they were those were bought up in a state of desperation, right, by uh, certain individuals who already had capital who then, and often were supported by uh, capital from the West, who then kind of became these oligarchs who Putin is sort of beholden to. Um, right. uh, again, uh, in China, I think there, there you have certain examples of a very, very tangible poverty alleviation that's helping people. I also think very indicative in China is that while they do obviously use regulation to prevent, um, I would generously say, certain forms of neocolonization, um, I think that um, in China, there's a relative absence of that kind of conservative social ideology. It is there, yeah. right? But look, I want to go and say, look, in China, we have for same-sex marriage, we have 29% um, for 29% for, se uh, 29% for um, se uh, 51% against. Um, so that's 29 compared to seven, right? And of course, you know, there are people yeah. in China living in places that have been barely touched by, by urbanization and so forth. Um, so what I'm saying is that I feel like, in, you know, and by the way, I want to say something else. I don't know if you know about um, so Weibo. Uh, Weibo, and I believe it was April 2018, uh, Weibo began censoring uh, homosexual content. Uh, and I don't know if it was the China Daily or the People, People's Daily, the English language version. But they came out and they ran an editorial uh, condemning Weibo, the government government paper in any case. They came out condemning Weibo's censorship of homosexual yeah. content. And they said that uh, homosexuality is not a mental illness and that people deserve dignity and respect um, in terms of how they yeah. live. So I'm just using this as an example that you see that China seems to be going in quite a positive direction, right? It's a more conservative society, obviously, than, you know, Amps, you know Netherlands, of course. Um, but it seems to be going in quite a positive direction when it comes to some of these social yeah, so Andrew says you haven't said nuance yet. Yes, we have. <laughs> what, is, what is the nuance? Well, I was, I, whether I, I said I think, it or not, I was definitely calling for the no, nuance of understanding of the conflict in Belarus. Here's the nuance today. The nuance today, the nuance of the day is, <laughs> I would say, I would say to some extent that authority against capitalism is, is you know, that's part of the socialist project. Um, and, but then, fascism is so bad. Is that not nuanced enough? So like Luca is like, sure, to some extent, Luca might be having some sort of reforms against capital, but you know, to what extent that he fails in doing that, you look at the, what the unions are advocating, you have to, you have to then side with who, who is working against the tendencies of capitalism to exploit people. And then um, you don't just give blanket support to, to fucking fascists, right? <laughs> Which people love to do, MLs love to do. Um, well, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, um, isn't it telling again that the most reactionary regimes in social, in social terms are the ones that are the most connected to, I said, specifically regional economic interests, right? So if you look at Saudi Arabia and oil production, I mean, a lot of the, the political support Putin was getting was coming out of the petroleum industry, right? Yeah. Um, again, there, there's a more, uh, and I don't want to glor just generically glorify bourgeois society, but there's a more uh, cosmopolitan and liberal way of thinking that tends to go hand in hand. Uh, with the support uh, of sort of big international capital. Um, what we need to identify here, nuance, what we need to identify here is that as uh, socialists, it's not enough uh, to side with individuals uh, who are uh, pitting uh, more uh, domestic, uh, uh, more localized forms of capital or capital interests against uh, big capital, you know, in its sort of cosmopolitan ideology. They tend okay. to be socially conservative, but whether we're talking about is no Saudi whether we're talking about the king in Saudi Arabia, whether we're talking about Lukashenko, whether we're talking about Putin, whether we're talking about Trump to some extent, to some extent um, that is not a genuine leftist position. Now that having been said, right, uh, you know, I, I think this still does leave us with the question of China, who I don't think uh, uh, fit this criteria, right, in the same way that some of the other uh, states that I mentioned do. Um, so again, I'm, I want to offer I want to offer a bit of an explanation for my own um, fair, fairly charitable position vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, what do you think of that, Elliot? What do you think of Ernesto? 
it, mm -hmm. it makes yeah it makes sense to a certain extent um but to me i think the the tension for me is uh between you know a lot of people a lot of the complaints about anarchists are they they don't know what the fuck they're talking about but i think if you 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 consider the anarchist position as a general anti-capitalist position versus a sort of more marxist read on things which is based on means of production based on sort of super sensible external um you know mechanisms and how they're operating i think you know generally pitting the sort of smaller interests of capital would not be like trades people. So I think trades, like, you know, trades unions is not necessarily pitting small capital against big capital. I think that is an anti-capitalist movement, a, you know, a worker's movement. Um, so I, I would be more sympathetic, I think, towards, towards um, unions and just efforts, anti-capitalism in terms of what do we call ourselves, socialists, leftists, mm -hmm. social. I, I like, I like anti-capitalist, how about anti-capitalist? Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, um, because in terms of what is the real movement of communism, and you know, change away the way away the way things are, the real movement away from the way things are. But in in an anti in a distinctly mm -hmm. anti capitalist, um, it's very hard. It's very right. hard, isn't it? Right. If we're talking about state capitalism, because once you form a state, yeah. right, that is um, nominally exposes or actually exposes, let's say, communist ideology, um, you know, it becomes not just a political organization that's representative of one social class, it becomes like, you know, a, a body of governance for a whole society, right? Which means it has to kind of um, subsume all the diversity of the society into that, right? Um, yeah. You know, and, and so, you know, in China, there's a real question of like, some people, sometimes people talk about, you know, the current Chinese Communist Party as being in the interest of kind of affluent middle classes. Um, there's a question of, you know, well, first of all, China in the first place was not a proletarian context at all. Right, we're talking about peasants and so forth, right? So, so yeah. what is the social class, right? You know, is it is right. it is it dispossessed agricultures in the countryside? I mean, China China didn't exactly have the Chinese Communist Party didn't exactly have a clearly defined social class from the beginning, right? Um, so, but but the point is, like, you know, we, I, I think the important question is, um, is it the case today that the Chinese Communist Party can be said to um, agitate on behalf of the interests uh, of um, uh, those individuals? Uh, who still, you know, economically suffer today. In sure, the and they can, um, in, in the capacity that they do, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess what I mean is like, you know, I, I think that we have to, we shouldn't, you know, we have to be careful also about like, um, we have to safeguard ourselves against, um, you know, just saying, oh, like Assad, he said tuitions are too high, so he's, you know, a socialist, okay. But for, um, yeah. but for instance, I wouldn't necessarily be against, like to be, be against, say, a workers' movement attempting to exist, although they would be summarily crushed um, in in China, for instance, in terms of what, say, yeah. a workers' movement emerges and they're like, these conditions are bad here in this particular department. And they do it and they don't go through the regular, you know, means of the party which they're supposed to or the labor because it's not working. I, you know, I, I, I would not say this is a movement against socialism. Mm -hmm. I would say it's a distinct, it's a real anti-capitalist movement. And so we don't dismiss it. That's all. Well, the, the difference to me between, the difference between to me, like, you know, I think that um, the real nuance to take here is, you know, I think it's something by, there's a, a I'm trying to remember which work by Brecht, uh, but within it, there's a young guy and he's talking about leaving the communist party. And there's an older guy in the party and he's kind of offering advice. And he's saying like, you know, um, you you should stay basically because um you know the party needs sort of this dissidence right in order to kind of dialectically sublate it and kind of enrich itself um yeah. i feel like the real nuance is that you know you can be both pro chinese communist party and pro let's say because there are you know there are, there are like ultra left in china like maoists pro working like trade unionists and so on sure. um, you can you can support that in terms of defending the the, the great positive legacy that the Chinese Communist Party has created in many respects, but also recognizing its limitations and knowing that those have to be opposed. Um, so, you know, again, I think the, the problem that I see if we talk about, um, you know, a lot of left comms is like they go so far in the direction of just opposing any kind of yeah. actual state formation like China um, sure. that they just buy into like the most shallow sort of manipulated um, you know, anti, yeah, anti-Chinese yeah, anti propaganda or whatever. I think the challenge is again to support uh, uh, to support uh, the state socialism, but also to support the internal movement against it, um, and to understand how those things can can um, 
uh, interact in such a way as to lead to the enrichment uh, mm -hmm. of the general struggle. Of course, if you are a Chinese Communist Party member, you don't have that luxury because you just like, you said what? <laughs> you just have to toe the line. Well, that's uh, why we have this great luxury here at, at Zero Books Capital Comrades. Yeah. So, um, and I'm really hoping it'd be very interesting to, when we do our China studies, because I feel like um, there's not many people who enjoy a little bit like, you know, French or Italian intellectuals vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. There's not many people who I think enjoy uh, the sort of media access that we have. Um, we don't read Chinese, obviously, it's an issue, but but I just mean the kind of, you know, freedom to broadcast here and talk about these things, but also yeah. not, you know, and, and not, not valorizing China, but also not just going to this uh, reflexive uh, sinophobic line. Um, and so I really, really hope when, when we start to talk about that, um, that we can maybe hope build an audience yeah. um, and, and maybe help uh, enrich discourse and, and help stop, I think, what now really is the march to war, I would say, um, sadly, uh, which is what seems to be happening. March, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe march to war. Uh, it would be really stupid. It would just kill everybody. It would be. I mean, I personally, <laughs> And you know, you can take my opinion with a grain of salt. Yeah. But I feel it's more like a march towards a cold war, more than an actual open oh, right. war. Yeah, sure. Well, um, yeah, but I, yeah, the cold, so, war, okay. the cold war might have boiled, had a lot. There was a lot of almost boil over points in the cold war, though, too, to that month. Yeah, but but I mean, those happened because there was like this giant, this uh, massive tension of uh, armed forces, right? We're, no, we're no, there'll, there'll, there'll be a, there'll be there'll be a cold war. I'm just saying we can't say yeah. for a certainty that the next cold war will not end up being a hot war. Right. Oh um, yeah, def yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I just feel we aren't at that stage yet, right? Guys, we're, we're at heading two there. hours. We are at two hours. Yeah. Um, okay. So maybe we should wrap it up. Last, last note. I'm last note. I'm gonna say though. I said like the sort of military buildup and proxy confrontations that a Cold War China would generate could potentially, in the eyes of certain American policymakers, help them get out of the current economic malaise um, by with all kinds of military investment and things like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. no doubt. So leftists, socialists, anti-capitalists, curious artists, uh, weird nozbols who found this. Our nozbol, our, our we love you. We love our nozbol audience. Sorry, uh, sorry I banned you, but you, you know you I'm not going to post probably nozbol. <laughs> um, we're we're hoping to bring, but we're, but we're hoping to educate these. Nozbols. We're hoping to bring them, you know, bring them into a more not gonna, uh, nuanced, not gonna, um, yeah, a, a more nuanced, nuanced system, standpoint. Yeah. Get them to read theory. Uh, yeah, get them yeah. into theory. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. But so, uh, we're taking a break next week, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So next week we won't be here because Con Conrad Conrad is not going to be here next week, and also, but the week after that we'll be here. Yeah. So so two of the next two of the next few weeks we won't we won't be doing it. Yeah. Can you tell us what we'll be doing, Conrad, or is it going to be a surprise for later? Uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about that later. Yeah. And we're not going to talk about it on air in front of everybody. We'll talk about it later. Um, not, but um. <laughs> But 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 okay. Thanks so thanks so much, guys. Uh, and uh, and we what will we will see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> this will be. This has been uh, zero book uh, zero books basement discussing capital with Elliot Rosenstock, the imaginary Ernesto Vargas, the real, and Conrad Hamilton, the symbolic. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention. All right.